Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Hitoshi Utsunomiya, Director of Japan Sake and Shochu Makers Association. This is our second session of presenting sake to your market. Collaboration with Michael. If this is the first time to join the program, welcome. And if you attended the previous one, hello again, and thank you for attending again. As the sponsor of this program, I'd like to say a few words. The Japan Sake and Shochu Makers Association, JSS, was founded in 1953. There are about 1,400 sake breweries and 300 shochu distilleries in Japan. Nearly all of them are members of our association. So, on behalf of our members, we aim to introduce the joy of sake and shochu to all over the world. We hope that knowledge of sake could contribute to you and the Canadian food culture. Now, thank you very much, Michael, to organize this insightful webinar for sake. I hope he will publish the book, Exploring the World of Japanese Craft Sake, Rice, Water, and Earth, with Kosa Nanshi Matsumoto. I'm really looking forward to reading his book. We believe that sake can be a great strength for sommeliers. Today, we prepared different types of sake from various regions in Japan. I hope this program could be a great start to the relationship between you, the professions, and members of JSS. Please enjoy. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Thank you very much to Utsunomiya Sensei uh, for your fantastic welcome words. Um, it's always a pleasure to do this. It gives me an ex excuse to connect with um, people in Japan like Utsunomiya Sensei and Hiromi-san uh, from the Japan Sake and Shochu Makers Association, and also bring in some sake friends from around the world, um, like Alexander Koblinger from Austria and um, Sachiko Miyagi and Bo Timken from the West Coast. Um, so it's, uh, you know, and I get to talk about sake for the next two hours. How lucky am I? So uh, with that said, uh, we're going to cover a lot in, uh, in a very short amount of time. Um, I, I could easily talk on some of these subjects for much longer. Um, but uh, we're going we're gonna to start with a little bit of an overview of sake, um, the regions, Japan in general, just to give you a bit of the lay of the land. Uh, Alexander Koblinger is going to just guide us on how to taste sake from a sommelier's point of view. He's a master sommelier and nine-time um, best sommelier. So he's just uh, the perfect person to, to guide us through um, from, the, you know, from the side of uh, wine tasting as well as sake. Um, and then we're going to get into our regions. Um, for many of you tuning in, we've, uh, we were able to supply sake cases uh, to sommeliers in Toronto and in Montreal and also Quebec City. Uh, if you weren't able to get any of the sake for this, uh, that's okay. Um, look out for them, and um, we'll be making this video available in the future uh, for you to, um, you know, be able to taste offline with some of these. Uh, and also, some of what we're going to talk about applies to sake from um, other sakes from these prefectures as well. So I, I think, in many ways, you'll get uh, you, you'll get a, a little bit better burst in these regions, and then and be able to take it somewhere else. Um, and then I'd like to aim to finish at about three fifteen, so that we can uh, answer any questions that you have. Um, and um, then we'll we'll just say a kampai and 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 let it be. 
So um, if you if you have the sakes with you and you're wondering what to do, if they're in the fridge, you may want to consider taking them out sooner than later, um, just to gradually let them warm up. I tried mine about 15 minutes ago and I found they were a bit tight. They're a bit close. So I think just letting them gradually warm up right now will allow us to get a little bit more of the personality in the sakes. If you didn't chill them, that's okay. Um, certainly, uh, I would encourage you to try them at a variety of different temperatures. Room temperature is perfectly fine for many of these. Um, and, uh, and if, you know, and there's a sake warmer that was generously provided by the JSS uh, team. And they actually flew them over from Japan. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that as well and, and some experiments you can do afterward. Since you do have bottles of sake to enjoy, um, I would encourage you to try them at those different temperatures. But this is the order we're going to go in. One thing to note uh, is a, a couple of changes between or differences between the Toronto case and the case in uh, Montreal, Quebec. Um, we unfortunately, the, for the most part, most of the sakes are the same, but there are a couple of small changes due, due to the supply, availability, that kind of thing. So on sake number one, um, the, um, the sommeliers in uh, Montreal and Quebec are going to get the Kawachu Shuzo Sotembo. And in uh, Ontario, we're going to be trying the Asahi Shuzo Kubota. Uh, the Sotembo is not available in our market right now, but that's okay. Um, the Kubota is a fantastic sake uh, to have as well. And then um, the sixth sake, unfortunately, the Ontario group is the only one that was able to get it. The Miyagi sake uh, for Montreal and Quebec, uh, the Ura Kasumi um, just didn't make it. Um, the shipment is, hasn't arrived yet, and we weren't able to, to, uh, to get it into the boxes in time. Um, but in the future, some of the things that we're going to talk about with Miyagi, particularly with Hiwata, the Yamahai Junmai that we'll be trying as our Miyagi representative, will apply to, um, uh, to any Miyagi sakes that come into the market. Um, and actually, one last thing there is the, uh, there's, uh, the Kamo Izumi from Hiroshima that you all have. Um, we have noted that it was the Shusen Jumai Ginjo, but it's actually the Honjikomi Jumai Dai Ginjo um, that you all received. We weren't able to get the Shusen in time, um, but the Honjikomi is a fantastic representative of Kamo Izumi and the Hiroshima Sake style. So we'll, we're, we're in good hands there. Um, just a quick thank you to all the importers for making this happen in many ways, because we originally set out to, to, uh, to start this webinar or, to, or uh, to schedule this webinar in November of 2021. Uh, and then we were like, okay, uh, there's no sake available. It's not arriving until late December, early January. So we moved this tentatively to late January. Um, and then uh, sake wasn't you know, set to arrive yet. And so we kept pushing it back and um, but to be honest, for a while, I didn't think this webinar would actually happen with the amount of uh, changes. And there's still a lot of uh, supply chain issues going on. Uh, we had to do some rushes uh, to get the sake release from the LCBO um, and into the cases in time. And if you're wondering about sake in, um, in, on the Quebec side, um, you do have shipments that are slated to land uh, about the third week of March, um, most likely by early April. Um, you'll be seeing some sake arrive in the market. I know it's a fairly depleted market right now, but not for long. I think the timing of this webinar is great uh, in getting, getting your knowledge up and then uh, waiting for that sake to arrive and, uh, and be ready to hit the ground running when it does. So um, let's get into the overview here. Um, so in general, uh, these are a few of the key uh, trends going on in Japan, and, and, and really there's a lot of uh, different things happening. Um, uh, one of the things to note is um, that it's a really exciting time for sake. Um, we're going we're gonna to touch on the history of it. We're going to touch on some of these um, trends, but really, um, you know, as you start to delve deeper and deeper in it, you notice that things are moving very quickly. Uh, in the world of sake. Um, and so it's, it's a really fun time to go. I mean, I've been to Japan many times and every time I've gone in the last five years, something is turned on its head. That is such a fun thing to happen because you're constantly like 
you know, waiting to, you know, to, to see what happens. Um, but some of the things to look out for, and I, I know certainly for myself in, in our market, I'd like to do a webinar on sparkling sake in the, in the near future. Awa, or sparkling sake has really come a long way in, in such a short time, in the last decade or so. Um, you know, in advance of the Tokyo Olympics, um, there was an, uh, an association that was developed called the Awa Association. And it was developed to actually um, uh, basically inc increase the quality of uh, Japanese sparkling sake um, using traditional methods um, and, and, uh, and, you know, you know, experimenting on maturation and all kinds of other techniques, um, because it is very different than sparkling wine. Um, but, and there's some phenomenal sparkling sakes available uh, in Japan right now. And there's a few of them that are arriving or have arrived in our market. Once we have enough of them in the market, I'm definitely going to be doing some kind of a masterclass on it, um, either at IWEG, at my wine school, uh, or perhaps with the JSS in the future. Another thing I'll touch on in a minute is the rice polishing advancements. I find that really interesting. Um, Kamo, uh, Kame and Kiyoke uh, Brewing, that's, I, I, I found this interesting and I thought as since we have so many wine sommeliers on here, I thought it'd be interesting to mention, Kames are these large ceramic fermentation pots um, that used to be used um, before the Edo period. So before they learned planing techniques, where they could seal wooden barrels in, in, and make large barrels for fermentation. Uh, kame was, was the predominant way that sake was fermented. And so uh, there's a number of breweries bringing this back. Same thing with kiyoke. Kiyoke are the large wooden tanks and they were used prevalent, prevalently in the Edo period uh, and right up to World War II actually, they were in, um, they were in use. But then after uh, World War II, the industry and all that uh, generally changed to enamel and stainless steel tanks, um, which meant that you could brew cleaner sake in many ways. But a lot of brewers now are actually going back to these Kiyoke tanks as well, which is cool. French wine influences, there's, um, there's, I, I, in general, actually, it's just wine influences in general. Um, a, a lot of the younger generations of sake brewers are traveling uh, or went to, to school in other countries. Um, you know, learned, they saw what was going on in wine, the experimentation going on in wine and brought that back. And so while there, a lot of them have a, a foot still firmly rooted in tradition, um, a lot of them are also trying to forge ahead and see what, what else can be done. And so it's a really, a, one of the reasons why there's so many new trends going on now. It's like they've perfected ginjo and daiginjo making. They understand more about how to work with koji and yeast, these two microorganisms in the tank. And so, you know, they're, they're able to, to forge ahead because they've got this better grasp of, of, of a lot of the things that, um, you know, uh, eluded brewers for many uh, decades in, in terms of their, uh, you know, learning things. Water terroir exploration. Um, I put that in because you'd be surprised to know that in the last, I, I've read a few scientific papers on it, but in the last two or three years, I forget exactly when, um, there's, a, there's a website that went up um, and it's dedicated to exploring the terroir water. And, and, and some of these scientific papers I've read uh, in the last decade are also in exploring this uh, topic. They, they wanna know more about how does water affect sake and can you can it identify a region and whatnot and so this is really interesting this is uh you know terroir is still a divisive issue or a, a word to say in in japanese the world of japanese sake it, it, it's a divisive word even in the world of wine for that matter um and so it's um it, it is interesting that you would think for a, a beverage that is as old as sake, Japanese sake that we would we would know more about water but it's still a bit of a mystery um and so there's there's continued exploration, which is really cool. And then geographical indications. Um, I, I put that in because the, the world of sake and, and GIs um, has changed very quickly and we'll get into that in a second. So this is a slide I put together just to show you a little bit about what's happening um, in, in the sake world. You know, if you go back, as most of you know, the, the grading of sake has to do with how much of the rice you polish away. Um, and, and for the most part, that, that has been done using conventional um, uh, um, 
polishing uh, machines are vertical using a vertical rice polishing machine from the 1930s. Uh, the polish wheel and all that didn't, didn't give you a lot of control. And as you can see, it would just polish the same way. Didn't matter what the rice was. It was always polished the same way. Um, and more recently, there's a handful of brewers. I, I, I would say it's a really new trend, but uh, there's uh, the, the first vertical rice polishing machines were developed by a company called Satake. Uh, in, in Hiroshima, and um, Satake's developed a way, um, a, a has changed, uh, basically enabled control for the sake brewer to polish either in the hempe, genke, or conventional method, which means that now you can start polishing in different shapes uh, with the rice. And keep in mind that rice, uh, uh, different sake rice uh, strains that are used in sake making all have a different shinpaku uh, shape. So some of them are big and fat and round, and some of them are, 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 are linear and oblong. Uh, in shape. And so uh, polishing them the same way doesn't make sense. So this is could be a game changer in the future. Um, there are some implications here to this because it, it means that you could theoretically polish less of the rice away and still make a sake that tastes like a daiginjo. Um, and so th this is really interesting and something to pay attention to in the future as more and more brewers, um, you know, either uh, you know, gravitate to this, this, th these methods or not. If you're looking for some uh, breweries to look out for that does that, um, the Daishichi in Fukushima um, was probably one of the first pioneers of, uh, of using flat rice polishing. Um, and uh, Imada Shuzo in Hiroshima um, really embraced from, a, uh, from an early get-go, and this is probably just less than a decade ago uh, that the satake came up with these different ways of polishing the rice. And Imada-san from Imada Shuzo is one of the first to really jump on and, uh, and, and explore what it, what it could mean. And so um, if, if you get a chance, look out for those sakes. Now, in terms of geographical indications, uh, I, I'm laughing a little bit because I was just reading uh, an industry report by John Bonner, which I think many of you know. And um, he just reported about an hour ago that uh, Shiga is probably about to be awarded a GI. It's not official yet, but um, so this is, is prevalent to this, this slide. So geographical indications in sake, in 2005, there was one for a small area called Hakusan in Ishikawa. And it, it, it basically encompassed five brewers in that region. By 2016, uh, the word Nihonshu, which is Japanese sake, was protected, much like the word champagne uh, for sparkling wine in the Champagne region of France. Yamagata uh, became the, the, the second geographical indication for a region and the first for a prefecture-wide um, uh, geographical indication. Now, so we go from 2005 to one, from one, 2016, we've got two, and now look at it. Look what's going on. It, this is 2022. The most recent, apart from Shiga, was uh, on February 7th, so about a month ago. And so the world is really changing. In the, the sake world is changing very quickly right now. Um, and uh, it, again, this is exciting. Uh, there's there's pundits that are um, th that think this is a marketing uh, thing, and in many ways, it it, it can be construed that way. But also, um, this lends attention to all these regions. It, it shines a light right on to Hagi in, down in uh, Yamaguchi. Um, it shines a light on Tone Numata in Gunma. Like these places were probably not well, uh, uh, well known um, for sake, uh, sake uh, connoisseurs or whatnot uh, uh, in the past. And so it, it does shed a light there. And the, uh, the whole idea with this is that you get to know the area. The, uh, and, and so right now, the rules and regulations are quite general. Um, it, 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 they're designed for the most part to allow brewers to accept the system. Um, and it'll be really interesting to see what happens in the future. If you, if you look at the uh, AOC or AOPs of uh, France, uh, French wine, in the 1930s, you had a handful, and now look at it. There's just so many of them. You know, they, this, they, they, 
we, we start to shine a, a, a flashlight at even smaller regions and trying to understand that. So I'm going to be very curious to see what happens uh, in the next 10, 20 years with this system. Um, it's too soon to tell, of course, but I think it's interesting nonetheless. So let's get into a couple of general concepts on sake making. You all know, I think, um, but sake is a rice brew beverage. It's made with rice water, something called kojikin which is a microorganism used to break down the starches and chop up that starch into fermentable sugars. And then yeast, uh, which ferments those sugars into alcohol. And we have brewer's alcohol, of course, which is an optional add-on uh, for some styles of brewer, uh, of, of sake. Now, the one interesting thing, and we're not gonna get into sake making uh, in, in any depth here, but it's really important to note that unlike wine and beer, um, sake making uh, is really un unique in that as the koji breaks down those starches and makes sugar, the yeast is fermenting those sugars into alcohol simultaneously or in, in parallel in the same tank. Brewers make it look very easy, but I assure you it's, it's quite a difficult thing to, to keep these two in harmony. Um, without creating off flavors, which can easily happen. And so, um, you know, one of the one of the magical properties of sake making. Um, let's look at rice a little bit here. Um, so there's many, many sake specific rice strains. There's also a lot of ipanmai or table strains that are used um, for, for sake making, depending on the grade, the style, etc. Um, but uh, for the sake specific rice, um, what they all have in common is a shinpaku, so a star chart. So uh, it's important to note that that starch uh, as the grain ripens, the starches move into the middle of the grain, fats and proteins surround the outside. I often use the analogy of a, a sunny side up egg. Um, you're basically your, your egg yolk is your starch and that's really what brewers want, um, which they'll break down into sugars and then ferment that sugar to alcohol. Those fats and proteins are your egg white and really uh, you leave more of those on, um, you get more of the rice uh, side of sake. If you remove more of those and use specialty yeast, we can get some more fruity, fragrant, more wine-like um, aromas or profile out of the sake. Some, I think most of you have seen this by now. This is a, a my sake periodic uh, table of rice, and it really does show you how many rice strains there are. And, and I, I think this one's not even up to date. There's new rice strains that I, I should add to this. And, and it includes a handful of the table strains, but not all of them. If I added another, all the table strains, we'd be adding easily another 30 or 40 strains to this. Now, um, where I wanted to go, since we're going to be talking about regions and we're going to be trying sakes with a, a, a with different rice strains like Goyaka Mengoku and Miyama Nishiki, Omachi, Yamada Nishiki, for instance. Um, these rice strains uh, are, are quite different. And I'm hoping that when we start to try the sakes, you'll be able to get some of these, um, the, the differences in, in what the rice uh, has to do. So um, one thing to consider is something called wase versus okute uh, rice. Wase are usually the northern rice strains in, in the north of Japan, particularly on that west side. Um, winter, the, basically, the growing season is quite short uh, compared to in the south. And so that means that your rice uh, has, your, your plant has to be planted earlier um, and you need to ripen your rice um, in advance of, you know, the cold weather and the winter uh, snows that, that are going to arrive. And so in general, uh, when that happens, and, and some good examples of wase rice or, or there's cold climate rice strains would be Goya, Kamangoku, and Yamanishiki. Because of that shorter growing season, what happens is you end up with a harder rice. And that harder rice is usually manifested as a lighter, a cleaner um, uh, a flavor profile or, or, or in general profile to the sake, which I think you're going to see when we try. Um, we've got a Goyaka Mangoku um, uh, 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 sake with the Kubota. And uh, we have um, a blend of Niyama Nishiki and uh, Goyaka Mangoku in the Hiwata, the, the sake from Miyagi, which I think you'll be able to see, especially when you go back and forth. Um, so throughout the tasting today, do go back and forth between sakes because they're quite subtle on their own, 
But when you, you go from one to the other and back, um, you really see same things. And so in the Okute, in the Southern styles, where it's warmer, you've got a longer growing season. Some of these can, plant, uh, can harvest as like into October and early November, uh, like Omachi and Yamaranishiki. And so what happens is you get a, generally a rounder, richer, fuller kind of flavor profile to the sake. And I think that will be seen in, in quickly trying these earlier. We've got a, a Yamada Nishiki rice from Hiroshima or sake. And uh, we've got uh, Omachi sake from with the Sanzen and the Kayun, uh, the Yamada Nishiki from Kayun. Those are going to give you an idea of what's going on or, or some of those, the, the differences between a wase and okute. I think they're, they're going to illustrate that point quite well. Some other considerations. I mean, water is, is quite important. Historically, water, uh, water for sake was, you know, in, if you go back to the Nada Gogo area, which we're going to be talking about, uh, which is an area right in Kobe. Uh, city, uh, the water there became very famous because it was a harder water. Um, in many ways, it's the Shabalia water. It has a has a, a mineral hardness, and that's how sake, um, particularly in the Edo period, really uh, gravitated to the, the the sake making styles. A lot of it was developed to go with this harder water. Um, but as we understood more about brewing techniques and whatnot. Um, you know, being able to use softer water with less minerals in the water meant that you could slow down the yeast um, uh, and, and the fermentation process from, from going. And that became quite important if you were making uh, aromatic, floral, fruity styles of sake. You didn't want a fast fermentation. Um, you wanted to slow that down. And so you can see some of the differences here that water can have. Um, Generally, a harder water, um, you're going to have a, you could tend to have a drier sake and it might not necessarily be dry, but um, there's an angular or sharpness to the sake because of the minerals um, that does give it a drying effect, even if there's a bit of residual sugar in it. Um, and usually there's less uh, or a fewer floral or, uh, and fruity aromas to the sake. Um, not necessarily, I mean, I know some brewers that use very hard water now and ferment at very, very cold temperatures and to slow down fermentation. And, and there's so much minerals in the water that they're able to ferment, continue, keep the yeast going. Um, and they're making beautiful um, Ginjo, Dai Ginjo style sakes with that water. Um, so again, this is, uh, there, there's just, there's always going to be a moment at where um, a rule, something that you see on paper, there's an exception to that rule. Um, but with softer water, generally, um, you, you, you'll have a softer palate to it. But it, because you've got less minerals, you're slowing down fermentation. You're allowing those fruity floral ginjo aromas to develop um, with yeast that thrive in colder conditions or colder fermentation temperatures. Um, and generally, you know, water in Japan is soft. Um, there's uh, historically, as I mentioned in Nada, in that region of Nada, the harder water there was important, but that is a very kind of uh, uh, unique area of uh, sake making. Another one is in Ishikawa. There's a harder, there, uh, brewers there have gotten used to using a harder water that they find in their groundwater there. Um, but for the most part, you can see here, Japan is a lot of, it's very mountainous. And so all the precipitation that falls on Japan is pretty much captured by the forests and the mountains, uh, you know, in, but, and, and there's mountains that bisect the main island of Japan of Honshu. Uh, and so this water, you know, collects, it's generally soft and it flows out quite quickly uh, to the, either the Sea of Japan or the Pacific side. There's not a lot of opportunity for it to, cap, uh, to, to, um, uh, to, to capture um, any minerals. Um, or, or hardness. These are some of the key brewing waters you'd find in Japan. Um, we're going to be going to Nada Gogo. You can see that on the map where Kobe is. We're going to be going to Saijo in Hiroshima. Um, we're going to be trying the Kamo Izumi there. We're going to be also near Mount Fuji. Um, I don't think we're necessarily trying this water because the brewery uh, for Doi Shuzo or the Kayun that you have is a bit further west of uh, of Mount Fuji, but uh, in general, the water is similar. It's on the softer side. And then Niigata, of course, we're gonna be trying water from the Shinano River in the Kubota uh, and the Senbo. Um, and so we'll, we're, we're gonna try a few of these. 
Yeast is in many ways a very important ingredient for sake making. Um, it does inform whether or not you're going to have a very aromatic sake or a more cereal driven, lower aromatic um, profile to the sake. Um, and so this is all important. Uh, for the most part, yeasts are purchased from the Brewer Society. Um, and so there's a whole suite that basically the light gray ones on the left side of this uh, yeast honeycomb uh, are, um, are Jozo Kyokai yeast. So, so they're, they're yeast that you purchase or distributed by the uh, brewery, Brewing Society. The ones on the right side are regional specific. Um, and to give you an idea of some regions where um, sake yeast does play into the regional profile of the sake. Um, the ones in red um, tend to have a very strong yeast uh, program. Uh, and the ones in blue have a fairly strong one as well. And then, of course, there's pockets around Japan that aren't highlighted that where you're going to find yeast as well that come into play. But uh, you'll notice Shizuoka. Uh, we're going to be trying a sake with uh, Shizuoka yeast shortly. Um, and the for the most part, the, the sakes that are made in, the, in Shizuoka, you know, often are using Shizuoka yeast, which create a specific profile to the sake. Same could be said about Kochi uh, down in the south there. Um, there's yeast, they really like dry sake there. And um, for the most part, you can get really bone dry and beautifully aromatic sakes from, from Kochi. Okay, I've already talked about this, but it's really important to note, you got the star chart in the middle, you got the fat and protein around the outside. Those proteins will turn into amino acids if you leave them on the rice. So you leave more of the proteins, there's more amino acids in the sake. More amino acids means more umami, more of that savoriness. You remove more of that fat and protein um, and you use those, those specialty yeasts, uh, you can create those fruity floral aromas. Um, this is just a quickly recap. I don't wanna spend any time here, but we're really going to be delving into the premium realm of sake. We don't have any futsushu here today, which is ordinary sake. Everything that we're trying is premium. And so, and, and again, pay attention to your bottles. You've got Junmai. Uh, if you see the word Junmai in a bottle, you know it's the, the alcohol in the bottle is purely from the fermentation of uh, the uh, fermentation process. No brewer's alcohol was added. If you don't see the word Junmai in a bottle, i.e. a good example is the, uh, uh, where is it? The uh, Kubota, for instance, the Kubota Senju is a Ginjo, not a Junmai Ginjo. So alcohol has been added. Um, and generally that alcohol is, is used to pull out a little bit more of the aromas in the sake, maybe create a little bit of a drier uh, profile on the palate to the sake. Um, although uh, brewers can have a variety of different reasons as to why they would, they would or uh, add or not add uh, sake. A few slides on the environment here. So, you know, I, I like this slide just because it shows you um, that Japan is on a parallel with a lot of very important winemaking regions around the world. Um, an interesting one is Napa Valley. We think of the sunshine in Napa. We think of them being able to ripen, not, uh, ripen Cabernet Sauvignon and that kind of thing. But um, if you go to Niigata, uh, which is where the Kubota and the Senbo are from, um, they're basically on a very similar latitude and it's incredibly snowy there. Whereas you get a lot of sunshine in Napa Valley. Um, in uh, Niigata, you can receive up to 30 feet annually of snow. Um, and it's not uncommon to have three meters or four meters of snow in parts of, of uh, Niigata, particularly around Nagaoka, where uh, the Senbo and the Kubota are from. Heavy snows is a, is, is a norm there. Um, now, Latitude um, can play a factor in a variety of things, the ingredients, fermentation, food, foodstuffs, that kind of thing. And so if you went from Hokkaido up in the north down to uh, Okinawa, you're looking at almost 20 degrees of uh, latitude, which means there's a variety of different climate zones going from the north to the south. Um, if you go to the right part of the bottom slide, you got mountains. And so, as I mentioned, there's a Honshu alone, the main island of Japan is, is uh, more than 75% mountains. And so altitude sometimes means that certain rice trains can't, uh, you know, thrive in a certain environment. Um, and so, and, and that's why there's so many different rice trains on that map or that periodic table I showed you. All these different regions uh, mean that, um, or 
there's all these different environments and different rice uh, plants have been developed very much like uh, grapevines uh, to suit a certain environment. Some of you have already seen this. So Japan is right in the ring of fire. Um, there's several converging tectonic plates right underneath um, that, that are subluxating and creating a lot of volcanic activity. Um, and so I, I mapped this out a few years ago. These are, for the most part, most of the, the active volcanoes in Japan. Um, and so there's a lot of them. Um, we're going to be going to a lot of these regions as well, uh, where the, 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 the volcanoes um, have, have helped really, you're not necessarily going to be trying a volcanic sake. It's not the same as in wine, um, because a lot of the volcanic soils don't really impart a lot of minerals on the waters used by sake brewers. Um, areas where you've got a harder water is usually because there's some limestone, some calcium deposits or something. Um, there's a few karst plateaus in the south of Japan and the region of Nada, and I'll talk about that later on. There's all kinds of, it used to be in a marine inlet. And so there's all kinds of uh, fossilized sea creatures there that do impart some mineral hardness to the water. But where these volcanoes and mountains are really shaped Japan and its sake is that historically, there was a period of, of about 150 years during the Edo period where you weren't really, um, Japan for the most part was isolated um, from Western um, influences. And so um, what happened was all these little regions throughout Japan, you know, that were basically um, uh, uh, divided by mountain ranges and whatnot, um, became very distinguished they they developed their own food styles their own pottery styles their own art uh, and with that sake was shaped and so mountain regions of japan uh, where that historically didn't have access to fresh food fresh fish for instance throughout the year um, developed styles that suited the foods that they would be eating uh, which would would involve you know, preserved foods or pickling, that kind of thing. Um, and so we won't get into this in too much detail here, but, you know, we've got sake from a lot of coastal regions here. And yeah, we'll talk about food as we go through. I'm, I'm concerned about time here. I just want to get going. So uh, just to, uh, to highlight, we've got about close to 7,000 islands that make up Japan, um, which is incredible. Um, but really there's four main islands. There's Hokkaido in the north, there's Honshu, which is the main island where Tokyo and Kyoto and Hiroshima and all these famous cities are from. You got Shikoku, uh, and then you have Kyushu in the south, and then Okinawa, we just keep following down the island chain all the way down to the south there. Um, there's the the there's 47 prefectures or provinces uh that that divide japan um and of those those 47 are divided into eight regions um so they're grouped into eight parts um which we won't get into here but what's interesting too you see at the bottom of the facts there we've got three primary planes so we've got the kanto plane the kanto plane is a large flat area where tokyo is We've got the Nobi Plain, which is where Nagoya is, and it bleeds into Gifu. And then we've got the Kansai Plain, which is where Osaka, Kobe, and parts of Kyoto are. And it's a flat area. And historically, these are three of the largest, uh, uh, because of these large flat areas, it just happens to be that's where the largest cities in Japan are, are located, or the metropolitan sprawls, because of that flat area. For the most part, the rest of Japan, uh, there are some flat areas, but um, it's generally not as, um, as, as large as you would find in those three main plains. Lastly, from a regional side, um, you know, in, in the summers, um, Japan is, is no stranger to uh, heavy rains uh, coming from the south. Um, and, but in the winter, you get all these Arctic, Arctic winds that come down from Lake Baikal. It's center on Lake Baikal and, and pressure system. Suck it across the Sea of Japan. And the Sea of Japan, um, there are warm water currents that come up between Korea and Japan into that Sea of Japan and, and create uh, quite a bit of evaporation. So you got this evaporation and these cold winds. It means lots of snow. And so as you can see, the western side of Japan um, typically bears the brunt of snowfall in the winter, which is not a bad thing. It's great. Lots of pure water for brewing. 
uh, that snow melt uh, means you got tons of great pure water for rice uh, cultivation. And some of the best rice fields in Japan are yielding the highest quality rice is on that area. I have that red circle there because that's basically roughly where um, Kubota and Senbo are from, right in the middle of that snow, kind of where the mountain, just, just before you get into the mountains of the middle. Okay, and lastly here um, on our overview, um, I, I'd like to put this in because if you if you start getting more and more into sake, start paying attention to some of the names that you're going to find on labels. Um, these old names, keep in mind, a lot of the sake breweries in Japan were established in the Edo period uh, or, or beyond the Edo period um, or even at the beginning of the Meiji period around 1868. And so a lot of the old names that they were using back then had to do with this map. This map is the old way that Japan's prefectures were, um, were carved. So you'll notice we've got 69 provinces here. And, and in present day Japan, we have 47. So basically at the beginning of the Meiji period, the borders of Japan's provinces were reshaped, recarved and renamed. But a lot of these names are still really important in the sake world. And I, in my opinion, very important to know. Echigo, for instance, we're going to be going to Niigata shortly. The old name for uh, Niigata was Echigo. Uh, the Echigo Brewing Guild is still one of the top three guilds. Um, Echigo, it, you will see ech the word Echigo in a variety of different sake brands uh, throughout the area. And so it, it, it's important to know these. You can might not you might see a bottle and not know where the bottle's from, but you pick up on some of these old names and you're like, it's from here. I know, I know that, and you can it, it informs you a little bit about what you would find. And to my point here, these are some of the old uh, or the the current Toji guilds. The ones in red are are basically uh, there's not a lot of members left of these guilds. Or there's some old guilds here, um, but you'll see a lot of the names here are the old Japanese pre Meiji names for for Japan: uh, Sanai, Echigo, Noto. Um, and so it's important to know these uh, to a certain de um, degree. Okay, with that said, we're going to get into our, our tastings in a minute. And before we do, um, I have Alexander Koblinger, who's going to quickly talk to you about uh, tasting. Um, feel free to taste along. He's using the Dewa Zakura Oka Ginjo. Unfortunately, we couldn't find any of the sakes we were going to be uh, providing you with um, in Austria. But um, regardless, feel free to taste with him and, and try to pick up uh, some sake. We're going to be going right into Niigata after. So maybe that's a good one to get. Get the Sembo, Sotembo, sorry, or the Kubota. And we'll see you in a minute. Hello together. I'm Alex Koblinger. I'm sitting now in Salzburg in Austria. And I have the honor to taste with you and to assess with you, or how would assess, a sake to talk you through the process and what to look for what to smell for and what to taste for. So I'm having um, with me a Deva Sakura um, Cherry Blossom. This is now a Ginju Sake and it's from the Yamagata region in Japan and it's made from Deva Sansan rice. So uh, basically how to approach a sake is similar to, definitely similar to, to a wine. So we're looking at the, at the appearance, um, we smell it, we taste it and make our conclusions. What's the main difference is on, a, on an approach on, on sake is how you're looking for the flavors, you're looking for some umami, you're looking for some texture, you're looking for some mouthfeel, and um, the flavors is much more refined some of the times. So we're not talking so much about primary aromas, about the sesame with a grape variety, so it's completely different on this one. And as well, you're having a lot of this um, lactic, dairy kind of flavors. So first of all, I would really suggest to to taste the sake out of a, um, a class, a regular tasting class, um, to really get the, seeing the color, um, the legs and everything. As well, you're having um, Kiki Choco. This is the small vessels with the, with the blue rings on it. And this is really to assess how clear the sake is, how non-hazy or non-cloudy to really reflect on this one. And, but to having this one, definitely we'll taste uh, some sake in, in the um, Kiki Choco, and, but we are tasting what I'm tasting with you now out of a, a wine glass. Um, first of all, you need 
some, like we have in, in, in the wine, some uh, background where you can see, really see the color, um, so a slightly tip the glass. Um, to go into it, this one, um, Deva, uh, Deva Sakura, we have in not, is not, I would say not clean or water white, so it's slightly kind of a very, very light um, yellow hue in it and some, some green hue, so really some of them, and it goes from really water white to can be really um, brown kind of color, so each sake can be really like a 10, 20, 30 year old sake can really brown or going like colors of caramel in this direction. And here we have a slight hazy, but if you have any caro sake or some, some barrel aged sake, you definitely have some color in there. So the next one um, to look at it is like how are the like the, the legs, the tears, the viscosity, what we have as well on the on the wines. So normally sake is always high in the viscosity. So the legs are always a little stronger, always going a little bit heavier down. So thinking about this, uh, sake is high in alcohol and has a, a lot of extract in it, so it goes down a little bit slower. Um, definitely, so we're having some really pale light colored sake with some high viscosity in it and as well is a little bit more viscous uh, than a wine is over if you smell it first of all again um, take the glass not swirl it so really taste make the first approach uh, without swirling it on this one as well to compare it with, with a wine um, you have more chance to detect flavors not the fruit flavors. So what happens if you uh, swill the glass, uh, the glass or the liquid is um, combined with some oxid, um, yeah, with some air and you're getting more fruit flavors out of it. So if you're not uh, going straight away swill it but leave it like this, the chance to detect small earthy kind of flavors, some lactic kind of flavors is much more given. Okay, so talking about this one, so first approach, the wine is definitely clear. It's definitely, it is fruit driven is this one. Um, if you're talking about clear, you're having as well thinking about some um, faults in the sake, so if it's perhaps could be some oxidation, uh, what you don't want to smell is like a hinika or a nama hinika. Um, these are some flavors going a little bit in the mixed pickles kind of flavors. So if you're finding this one in the, in the nose on the first approach, careful, go a little bit deeper in it, could be that you're having some, some fault problems in there. So, but this definitely is clear, has some ginjo flavors. So here we're going again with, with a sake approach. So ginjo flavors would be like this kind of banana, apple, pear, melon, lychee. So this is the, the ginjo card and we definitely Having here the melon, we having a little bit the pear, we having the a green banana coming in here. So some more would be like uh, raspberries, cherries, more on the crisp on the fresher side. Yeah. Then you're looking on sake if you find some cereals and some nuts and beans. So this going a little bit a little bit different to the wine as well. So a lot of kind of cereal flavors or more not is very common in sake. So if you grind some some toasted cereal, some malt, some porridge, steamed rice, this kind would be cereal. And nuts of course would be like um, almonds, chestnuts, walnut, roast, uh, roasted nuts, these kind of flavors. Herbs, spices, you can find as well. Definitely, some you can find some nutmeg, cinnamon, clove. But here we are the, on the Deva Sakura. We are more going into the fruit flavors. So really, this kind of cherries, raspberries, um, strawberries are combined with the ginjuka, with the apple and pear. Um, if you are talking about sweetness, I mean, you can't really smell smell sweet, but you associate it with sweet. So sweet would be like cotton candy. Um, sugar cane, molasse, this would be some kind of sweet flavors. Very common in sake as well. And some aged flavors, if you're having some color already at the approach, you can have some <coughs> caramel, soy sauce, dried fruits. So these are all common aromas if you're having some aged sake.
Okay, a lot of as well as some mushrooms can be in there. So you're looking for some umami. You're looking already for some umami. This is very different as well to the to the wine um, in the in the in the nose and as well on the palate. So umami would be, for example, as well a broth would be some some dashi, some mushrooms. All these kind of flavors are very high in a, in umami as well on the on the on the palate. So you're looking on this one on, on the sake as well. We're not talking so much about Wood. yeah if you can see it but not really that's uh, a huge difference to wine as well um, and as well you can some get some some earthy approach some clay some red stone as well but more looking into this kind of herbs nuts spices and as well this kind of lact lactic dairy some yogurt some some milk some cream and this is um, connected with the process how sake is made so you find a lot of these uh, lactic flavors Okay, so if we now going to taste the sake. Mm. So it's definitely no fault in this one. Um, I would say it's off dry. Um, very, very, or rarely a sake is bone dry. So bone dry will be Nihonju do really on the plus 10 or plus 12. Um, this one is like off dry. It's like creamy, silky, round kind of approach. Um, acidity is medium, yeah, I would say medium, um, with the touch of sweetness in there, very nice to, uh, very nice to drink. Alcohol is very good combined. So having the alcohol, always be careful, it makes always sake, if you uh, compare, it's always medium plus or high, if you compare it to, 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 to wine approach, so this one has 50 degrees of alcohol, but it's very, I would say everything is round, is elegant, is bounded together. Um, what comes to it again is not no, only the, the body, the alcohol, the acidity, um, uh, the sugar level. You find here you have to look as well on the mouthfeel and as well on the umami. So the mouthful would be how creamy, how round is the sake, or how crisp and clear is the mouthfeel. So it's from the body weight, it's definitely medium plus. But if you see this is a round, elegant, soft, creamy kind of sake, the acidity comes with it, but not too much. And then you're having this umami, the umami is in the back, you're having this kind of mushroomy, slightly earthy kind of flavors in here, some creamy lactic flavors as well. So you're getting nearly some cherry yogurt. Food flavors coming through, again the ginger car, we have in this kind of melon, more melon in the front, we have in this apple pear touch of banana then you have in these raspberries cherries the fruit flavors again again with this kind of lactic creamy or nearly raspberry yogurt kind of flavors then the umami comes as well with the spiciness touch of pepper and getting this this kind of broth dashi kind and as well the mushrooms fresh mushrooms fresh cut mushrooms and a very very long aftertaste um, lovely sake to drink monday fruit driven ginju side how it should be how it how we look on this one and, and how it how it really should show and honestly I really really like it and I love it I serve it in the restaurant and I wish you all the best for your course for your seminar and really go deep into it and it's different than wine and the more you're going into it the more you will love it and sake is a really amazing field of beverage to really highlight to look for and to get into it all the best from salzburg i wish you some fantastic days bye guys see you thank you alex um i have to say i i should have put it in the in the webinar uh, i have a picture of alex and i we we, we, we became friends uh, when we were inducted as sake samurai together in Kyoto. So uh, we, we endured the one hour of getting dressed in our kimono and, and going through this phenomenal ceremony. Um, anyway, uh, it was great to hear uh, Alex's take on it. And I wanted to touch upon a couple of um, aspects that he, that he mentioned. One is color. Uh, you can see the spectrum here of colors that you can find in sake in, for the most part in a, uh, in in 
most of the sake arriving that's 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 not um, you know uh, a specialty style it, it'll either be water white to an olive oil complexion anytime you start getting into deeper intensity color it was either improperly taken care of uh, or stored uh, or it's a specialty style where they've they've made it a certain way um you know for instance in ishikawa there are uh, they're big fans of making Yamahai Junmai and aging them for two or three years. And so you're, you're going to get a deeper intensity, uh, maybe gold uh, out of it. Uh, and sometimes even some amber and whatnot. And then if you're ever very lucky to, to come across some of the very old sake, so the oldest one I've tried is about 44 years old and it was a dark brown, smell like coffee. It was incredibly complex. It was one of those, it, it was like an old wine where you didn't even have to try it. You just, could sit there swirling it for 20 minutes and just getting things out of it. It just had such a, a fantastic story to tell. Um, a couple of other things here to note. Um, so again, there's the cereal side of sake and then there's the um, aromatic side. A lot of the arom aromas are uh, in sake either are, divide, are created from the yeasts that are used, particularly the fruity floral side. You're not going to get that from the rice itself. It's from the yeast. Um, aging as well can, it can factor in um, and a variety of other things. But um, if you're getting more cereal, savory uh, qualities, mushroom, beef broth, that kind of thing, that's either aging uh, or, and it's a June, and most likely they've left more of the rice on. Um, another thing I wanted to mention is the Nihon Shudo, because I think Alex mentioned it quickly. And it's also known as the sake meter value. Sometimes you'll see it, and I have it on the slides for each sake where, where I was able to find the information. Uh, and you've got to be careful with this, this, um, this scale. It's generally for brewers. Um, they test the sake every morning, and they're, they're trying to see where, where you know, things are. Um, and, and things like acidity in a sake can actually affect this. So something that you see something minus three, and you're like, oh, that's going to be really sweet. It doesn't have to be at all. It can be very balanced and, and the sweetness is, is not perceptible. Um, but generally plus 10 and, and, and below is where you're going to find most sake. I, I believe the Sotembo is a plus 10, which those of you in Montreal are quite lucky to find because they're quite rare in our market. Um, but keep in mind too, this scale um, isn't, uh, this is pretty much where most sake will fall under. But you can easily have some sakes that go on uh, on either way. Um, if you go if you go beyond plus ten, say a plus twenty, it, they're they're generally quite astringent, uh, and and generally I find those styles of junmai particularly are, are designed to be warmed. When you warm it up, you bring up the sweetness and it and balances that astringency, um, and 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 the bitterness that you might get uh, from from it being a plus ten. Same thing on the sweet side. The nigori we're going to try shortly. The sayuri is actually a minus uh, eleven on the scale. So we're going to be going beyond the scale on both sides here. Um, amino acids is another one. Alex talked a lot about umami and um, sake has no shortage of amino acids in it. Um, as you can see here, I've got them here and they all contribute something to the, the end profile of the sake. Uh, glutamic acid is a very important one. That's the source of umami in sake. And again, I think I've beat this like a dead horse, but you know, the more of those, the, the, fat, the proteins in particular you leave on the rice, the more glutamic acid you're going to uh, create uh, through the use of koji, uh, sacrification, etc. cetera. Um, and we're not going to be using, uh, as I mentioned, the JSS gave you a kankuki, which is a, a warm sake um, uh, a, a pot. And so what you can do is that boil some water. Um, fill the bath and then fill your fill the inner tokuri or the flask with your sake and pour, put it in there. Leave it for a few minutes. I would use the sake cup, the ochoko we came with, and just put it on top to cap it. And um, this is a great way of warming sake without it over overly warming. And with some of these, uh, I would encourage you to try uh, warming them up just to see how different they are. Uh, you can bring up very different personalities in the same sake doing this. I love pairing sake with food because of this. You can, you can take the same sake and shape it almost um, to your will uh, by temperature um, to, to properly match a dish. 
Um, and this is some of the ranges, like in Japan, uh, each temperature difference uh, has a name, uh, which is it, it, which is awesome. And and so, you know, and I, I visited a brewery in Yamagata once, which, uh, you know, they create a sake that could be served at a wide range of temperatures. And they had me try the sake. They, they kept warming it up uh, every four or five degrees. They would they took it out of the hot bath and gave it to me. And we got up to 55 degrees. It was really incredible to see how much the sake changed, especially if you go from it being warm, go back to a chilled version of it. Um, it it's really fun um, uh, exercise. Before we get into Niigata, I wanted to, uh, there was a couple of great questions in the Q&A and I would encourage more questions. I'll try to answer some after the videos, but if not, we'll answer them at the end. One was uh, from John, uh, you had a question about the, uh, the GI. So generally, the sake for a, G, a specific GI, the sake has to be made in the confines of the GI. It has to be bottled there, it has to be brewed there. But right now, some of them, not all, um, the rice can be from all over Japan. So you can purchase rice from anywhere in Japan, bring it to the brewery um and to use it but it has to be japanese sake rice you can't just bring in rice from somewhere else and and make it um also some of the gi stipulate um uh the grading of the the rice so generally the sake rice is graded into five uh, categories um and so what they'll do is they'll limit it that it has to be one of the top three grades of sake rice that you're using um, to again to, for for quality control or whatnot and some some of the gis have a tasting panel but each gi is is um is managed by itself um and so um you know th there are some differences there was another question from roger um on um some of the the predecessors of the gi and i'll talk about them in a second because we're on niigata and niigata has one of those predecessing uh regional uh, distinctions we'll talk about it here so we're in niigata niigata is um i'd say the number one uh producer of sake when it comes to the number of breweries there's more than 90 there's 90 or just a little over 90 sake breweries there. Um, I've seen 96, but the current number I've, I've come across a few times is 90. Um, and so, um, and it's ranked third in terms of volume after uh, Kyoto and uh, Hyogo. Um, and what's really important about Niigata is if you like dry sake, you like light styles of sake, Niigata is your friend um, because they pioneered in many ways the Tanle Karakuchi style um, that, they've become very famous for. So when I think Niigata, I think Tanmei Karakuchi. That means light, dry, crisp style of sake, um, which is what you get. And we're very lucky to have a couple of sakes that are going to show that. Um, and another thing is the Echigo Toji. Um, it, Niigata is home to the Echigo Toji. Toji is a master brewer. The Echigo Toji is a, a master brewer guild. And so the Echigo Toji are one of the top three guilds uh, and you saw how many guilds there were on that map i showed you earlier it's one of the top three and really they they've perfected this ten lake Karakuchi style um by doing a variety of things they they also um uh embraced technology so you know to create this ultra clean style of sake making they started using stainless steel they used, started using charcoal filtration um that kind of thing so that you get this water white sake that's just very light on the palate um, and whatnot. So you can see the pre meiji names. I've had them. I have this on uh, all the prefectural slides to 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 remind you of these old names because you will come across them. Sado is the island that you see, the S-shaped island off of the coast of Niigata, and Echigo is is uh, the 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 former name for the region we call Ni Niigata. As you can see, it's basically bookended between the Sea of Japan. And we've got these mountains that kind of form on the eastern side. We're going to be going into the kind of the the middle section, kind of where the mountains are at their tallest in a minute. Uh, we're going to be going to Nagaoka, and um, we're going to be following the Shinano River, uh, which kind of you know flows from Nagano all the way down into the Echigo Plain. Um, and uh, is a source of water for many breweries, uh, also a sor a sor an important source of water for all the rice cultivation in that area, um, which uh, creates some of the highest quality rice in Niigata and also in Japan. 
this is a great vantage point of uh, of Niigata. It's a it's largely quite flat on the uh, like along the coast, with this mountain uh, uh, kind of bookend on one side. And so as you get closer to the mountains, the snow gets heavier. As you get closer to the Sea of Japan side, the snow is still heavy, but not as heavy as you would find. But the area is very pristine. The cold uh, air the the cold air in the area. Um, really is is important for keeping other microbes at at bay. Uh, it keeps away spoilage uh, microbes and bacteria from um, you know thwarting a fermentation. Keep in mind we've got we already have two microorganisms that are going to be working in tandem in a fermentation tank. You don't want anything trying to compete uh, with them uh, during sake making. And so in the in that respect, this clean air is perfect. The, the clean air of Niigata is perfect for sake making. You can see the river flowing out along the Echigo Plain. That's the Shinano River, it's the longest river in Japan. Um, and it, it it's coming right from the mountains of Nagano, of the Japanese Alps. And so it's carrying a lot of pure snow melt with it. And so there's no, again, it's perfect. They're in a perfect situation for uh, sake making. Now, Roger, you had a question about uh, the some of the uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I think your question had to do with so are the GIs kind of overtaking, you know, some of the regional demarcations that were in a region, and and the Niigata OC is a good example. For to my knowledge, they haven't uh, because keep in mind um, a lot of the uh, the predecessors. Uh, a good one is Dewa three three, the Dewa San San um, uh, regional uh, marker, and that's just for Junmai Ginjo. Uh, there's specific polish rates, etc. Whereas the Yamagata GI uh, is a little bit more generic to be inclusive to a lot of these sake breweries. So these these um, these regional uh, stickers that you'll see on here have more stringent uh, rules than you'll find with some of the um, the wider GIs. And again, keep in mind, as I mentioned, these geographical indications that are coming up, particularly the prefecture wide ones. The, the uh, rules are quite relaxed right now. I suspect, and uh, Utsunomiya sensei had, had mentioned with, particularly with Yamagata and its GI, that there was some discussion about making um, some sub GIs within the larger GI, which I suspect would become more stringent in its rules. And so I think for any region, First is to get everyone to buy into it, get all the brewers on board. And, and in doing that, you cannot alienate a brewer who isn't conforming with very strict rules. Uh, you, and, and so I think this is a good thing. But the GI Niigata, as I mentioned, just came about uh, on February 7th. Um, again, although Niigata creates all kinds of fantastic, uh, cultivates a lot of fantastic sake rice, like Goyaka Mengoku and Koshi Tanre. Uh, you can use rice from outside of Niigata to make your GI Niigata sake. So this is a good example of where there's a difference between the Niigata originality control um, demarcation and the GI Niigata. Speaking of Goya Kamengoku, so Goya Kamengoku, if you remember two rice strains in your life, Goya Kamengoku and Yamada Nishiki are the, probably the two most important ones you want to learn. And then you learn everything else. Uh, Goyaka Mengoku is synonymous with Niigata. It's, 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 it helps shape that Tanrei Katakuchi style that, is, that they're known for. Um, and it's also influenced a lot of the neighboring prefectures that use a lot of Goyaka Mengoku. And in general, if you're finding a sake, uh, a good example is Fukushima. I've come across a great Daiginjo in Fukushima that was made with Goyaka Mengoku. And even before trying it, you see Goyaka Mengoku in the bottle, you know it's going to be a lighter taste. It's going to be maybe a little bit drier. And, and, and it's going to be kind of in that, maybe a bit of that Niigata way. And then, you know, the brewery is going to will it into its own character. Um, but Goyaka Mengoku in general, you're not going to get a really lush, full uh, taste with it. The Goyaka Mengoku rice is a wase rice, as I mentioned. So um, an early harvesting rice, it's harder. Um, and as, as it dissolves in the mash, it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't create the profile that you would find down in the South with Yamada Nishiki. In many ways, Goyaka Mengoku and Yamada Nishiki are night and day uh, when it comes to that. Now, one of the things with Goyaka Mengoku is it's a big fat round shimpaku. It, it is susceptible to cracking. So you've got to be careful when you're polishing it 
to higher degrees. And because of this problem, Cauchy Tenray was uh, was developed uh, in 2004. And Cauchy Tenray is a cross between Yamada Nishiki and Goyaka Mengoku. So they wanted the attribute, the drawing that that. The, the, the attributes of Goyaka Mengoku, but they also, Yamada Nishiki is, is used for a lot of Daiginjo Sake because it's, it's not as susceptible to cracking. So that's why it's used for a lot of Daiginjo Sake, particularly those that are polished to 35% or even lower than that, um, because it's, uh, it, you know, the Shimpaku on it is kind of tighter, it's more oblong, it, it enables more uh, polishing without the rice itself uh, being cracked. Echigo Toji, we've already talked about. Uh, they are part of that signature Tenrei Karakuchi style. And also Tsuki Haze Koji. Um, we don't have enough time to get into this, but uh, it's the way uh, the way you, 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 you grow the Koji mold on the rice. Uh, you either want it zoning into the center of the rice and creating just a little bit of enzymatic activity in, in that process, or you can coat the entire outside husk of rice, and that's called Sohaze. Uh, tsuki haze means there's less enzymatic uh, um, uh, uh, activity. Um, there's there's less ko koji spores on the surface of it, um, and so it's great if you're using a softer water and you're doing a slower fermentation and you're trying to create something that's lighter uh, in profile. If you want a richer style of sake or you're using more of the rice, more proteins, for instance, you're probably going to use a sohaze where you have more enzymes because you need more enzymes to break down those starches into, uh, uh, into sugars. But also in, a, in, in general, with, particularly with a harder water, you can ferment, fermentation happens faster and you need more production. You need more enzymatic activity to keep up with that. Um, so yeah, the, the, another term here, so you see Tenrei Katakuchi, but the, another term to, to note is Kide. Kide is uh, synonymous again with Niigata style of sake, and it's, it's something a lot of brewers try to do. And that's when you try the sake and you swallow, um, you know, uh, you could have a shorter or long finish in sake making or in sake, and it doesn't determine the quality. It's really the undesirable qualities in the sake that are, are really what you're that would kind of kind of knock it down, um, you know, on on a grading system, for instance. But what the Niigata brewers do perfectly is this kide thing. It means that the sake is there, and then it just vanishes like a ninja. I say this a lot because it's true. It's just kind of like it parachute, it shoots right back up into the ceiling and into the shadows because it, and and that is incredibly hard to do to make a sake that's there. It's 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 prominent and then just vanishes on you uh, is is very difficult. So generally, with the Niigata style, you, you get the short finish, the short cut finish, which is what kide means. Um, and so, with that said, we're going to try our two sake. So I have the Senju, the Kubota Ginjo. Um, unfortunately, I haven't tried the Sotembo, but I'll talk you through it a little bit. So first off, Asahi Shuzo um, uh, Kubota. Uh, is a great brewery. They're one of the pioneers of the Tenrei Katakuchi style of sake making. The great thing is, and this was by accident, because we were really, at, I was getting a bit desperate with the sakes and trying to find just sake in general for this, the webinar. And we were lucky enough to find two Niigata sakes from the same town of Nagaoka, which is pretty amazing. Um, so Quickly with Kubota, Asahi Shuzo, um, they focus on env environmental sustainability. So they do try to do a lot to, to they're stewards of the land. They, they, they know how important the rice fields are. Um, they don't want any chemical runoff. They don't want any of that. So they, they are uh, doing what they can um, in, um, in promoting the sustainability of, um, of their industry, the sake industry. Um, as I mentioned, the, the sake is from Nagaoka. And um, Senju, if you're wondering, means a thousand lives and many, a, a thousand long lives. In many ways, it's a great auspicious sake to start with. Um, and so uh, the Kubota brand has been around uh, for about 35 years. Um, it, uh, 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 and it, the name itself, Kubota, uh, it, my understanding is the area in, during the Edo period uh, where the brewery is located right now was called Kubota-ya. 
And so uh, they, at some point, took over that name as their, their, their flagship brand. This brand is famous around the, the planet. Um, it's a very, very sought after brand. It's a very typical Tanrei Katakuchi Niigata style. Um, and their uh, Toji Eiji Shima uh, was a, uh, uh, he, um, uh, he was uh, one of the pioneers in that Tanrei Katakuchi style. So you'll see we have Goya Kamengoku. You'll notice the koji was polished to 50% for this. And then the kake, kake is just regular steamed rice, kake mai, um, uh, was polished to 55%. Um, uh, so they went beyond the 60% cutoff of, that you would need. So they removed more of the rice to start this. But you'll notice 1.1 acidity, that's relatively low. It's actually very low in sake. And plus five is quite is on the dry side. So this is going to be a very light style of sake. I don't ever find Niigata sake to be overly perfumed and aromatic. Um, the style is just this very light, delicate sake. So while you explore that, I, I'm going to just talk quickly about the Sotembo. Um, and here's a couple of beautiful pictures of Asahi Shuzo's. That's Shima-san, Shimatoji on the bottom right there. And you can see how beautiful the area is. So you see the Shinano River and Nagaoka there in the distance. It's just a spectacularly beautiful area. I've only visited in winter and um, that was great. But um, I, I would love to go in the spring during rice harvest to, to see how, um, you know, it, I, I, it would be just a different uh, picture of, of, uh, of Japan or, or of Niigata to, to check out. Um, now, Kawachu Shuzo is, um, is our other um, Niigata sake for those uh, in, the, in Quebec. And um, first off, I want to mention Karakuchi Junmai. Karakuchi means dry in Japanese. So uh, it's going to be a dry taste. And it, it's, it's, it's the, uh, it's, it's the, it's half of the Tanrei Katakuchi thing. Now, what's really cool about this is Kawachu Shuzo, they buy a lot of their rice directly from the farmers right there, instead of going to the co-ops, the, the, the JA co-op. And so, um, you know, they, and they're also working with uh, a lot of organic rice. And it's, this is a really cool one. And I haven't actually tried this sake, it, but it's made with organic Takane Nishiki. Takane Nishiki is a rice from Nagano. It was developed for higher altitudes, for alpine climate in shorter growing season. Shorter growing season means it, it, it's great. It's perfectly at home in Niigata as well. Um, and uh, um, the, the rice itself is the parent of another really important Nagano rice called Miyama Nishiki. Um, and basically, uh, Takane Nishiki was exposed to gamma ray irradiation uh, and it mutated into Miyama Nishiki, which became one of the top five strains used and a very, the most important rice in Nagano at the moment. So for this one, they use 65% of the rice. It's a Jumai. Um, I would say there's probably going to be a little bit of mouthfeel, a little bit of that umami seeking in, but it's still going to be very light uh, on, in profile. Um, the um, Takani Nishiki is actually one of the earliest ripening grapes or, or grapes earliest ripening rice strains uh, in Japan, uh, rivaling Goyaka Mengoku. So it means that even though you get a bit of a richness uh, of flavor in the middle palate, it does finish sharply on the, on the finish. Um, and as you can see from the sake meter value, it's at a plus 10. Um, now, um, the water for both breweries is soft. Um, so this is going to be one of the softest sakes we're going to try or in terms of brewing water. Um, and uh, if you're wondering, gaiden, uh, gaiden means special issue. So this is uh, a, one of the, the, the brewery's new brands. Um, and uh, it's the, it, the, the brewery is helmed by the Kawachu brothers. So there's two brothers. Um, they're the ninth generation of the family to, to run the brewery uh, since the 1700s. And um, they, uh, yeah, just... Leave it at that, but the Katakuchi style is, again, perfect for, for what they're doing. So there we go. That's uh, Nomizu-san is the person on the left there. He's the Toji. Uh, and then he's also in the picture with the two gentlemen in the bottom right. And then one of the Kawachu brothers is on the right. Uh, and what I like about the picture is you see the Sugidama, the cedar ball up front. Um, and so if you're ever in Japan, you've never been, and you're looking for a sake brewery, Usually when you see the cedar ball hanging in front of a, a, a building, it's an indication that there's sake being made there. 
Now I'm just going to really quickly try this. I tried it when it was a bit too cold and it was really, really um, not, I wasn't getting a lot out of it. It's again, very delicate. The aromas are very clean and pure, a little bit of apple, a little bit of green banana. And very, very, oh my God, very clean, very dry. And there's that vanishing kide uh, finish that I'm talking about. And my mouth watered a little bit. That, that is, if you, if you have never tried Niigata sake before, this is benchmark. This is kind of a really good ground zero to base your other uh, Niigata sake experiences. Uh, I'm not saying any other things are going to be inferior to it. I mean, this is a really good example, that textbook definition of Tanrei Katakuchi. From there, you can see what other breweries are doing. So let's move on to Okayama. Okayama is the land of Omachi. Um, omachi is the oldest rice in Japan. We'll get into that in a minute. Um, and uh, in, in many ways, it's one of two rice strains that are prevalently listed on a bottle uh, because it is it's such an important rice. And let me see. I'm pretty sure, oh yeah, Omachi is on this one right here. If you look on the crest of the label, you can see Omachi kanji just down here at the bottom. Um, and so it, it's a very important uh, aspect of the sakes. And generally brewers from all over Japan, when they're using Omachi, usually put it on the label because it's an expensive rice for, for, some, for many reasons, which we'll talk about. So um, uh, Okayama is known uh, for the Bizen area. The Bizen area is known for its pottery culture. Um, and also Omachi uh, itself is cultivated in that area in the southeast side. It's also known for the Bichu Toji. Bichu Toji are from the southwest of Okayama. Um, and um, while they're not one of the big three, they're still uh, an active guilt uh, making sake and uh, are experts at using uh, Omachi rice uh, since it's been in their it's been in their region for very a very long time. So Okayama is located, as you can see, in the Chugoku area. The Chugoku Chugoku area is is everything that's highlighted here on the on the map, um, and then Okayama is in the southeastern quadrant of it. And uh, you can see the red of the mountains there in the center part. That's the Chugoku range. Um, that's the granite range that runs kind of down the southern spot, the southwestern uh, side of uh, Honshu. And then Mount Daisen there is the volcano you see right beside the word Totori up there, up there in the top. Keep a note on that for a minute because we're gonna talk about, I'll tell you a little Omachi story in a minute and it involves that, that volcano or that, well, yeah, it is a volcano. Um, okay, so this is Okayama um, and really we got Okayama city down at the bottom uh, in this alluvial plain uh, where all the rivers that come down from the mountains drain. Um, then you got the central plateau and then the high mountains at the top. Most of the breweries are located kind of mid or south of there. There's a handful of breweries located further north um, and um, really a, a very active area is that southeastern side, kind of northeast of Okayama city um, where the Bizen area is. And this is the Bizen area. You can see the Bichu area on the northwest side or sorry, the southwest. And then in the north, you have Mimasaka. So these are the three old names for um, uh, Okoyama. And you can see the rivers, the Yoshi, Asahi, and Takahashi River uh, coming down. The Yoshi River is important in Bizen as well as the Asahi River. Um, but the Takahashi River is important to note here because we're going to be trying the Sanzen shortly. And it uses water from that river system um, coming down uh, to make their sake. Bizen Ware, um, remember how I talked at the beginning of trends and how people are using Kame and Kiyoke? Uh, Kiyoke are those wooden tanks and Kame are the, the ceramic uh, uh, fermentation vessels. Well, a lot of those, the Bizen area uh, during the Edo period and before that was very important for making these large ceramic um, Kame or, or, or fermentation pots. Um, and so um, the area is uh, historically very famous uh, for using clay from the rice fields and all that to make uh, some of the best pottery you're gonna find. Some of the hardest pottery as well. They've got a very unique way of firing their, uh, their the, the, the ochoco and the vessels and plates, anything that they make with it. 
um, over a very long period where the heat is ex is is uh, increased towards the end of of, of the kiln. Um, and usually about like it could last about two weeks, which means that by the their end result is very hard pieces of uh, ceramic. Um, and so they're long lived. Um, some of these pieces, if you're looking to buy them are quite expensive for that reason. And there are three main patterns. We have no time for this, but I just think it's really in interesting. If you're ever in Japan, I was actually in uh, the heart of the Omachi area and I was dying to go to uh, the pottery area um, to buy some pottery and I, I couldn't get there in time. I just you know, everything looks so close until you start taking trains and I just gave up. But um, one of my bucket list things is to buy myself some, some really cool Bizen pottery uh, at some point. Um, anyway, uh, let's talk Omachi because that's the most important thing. We're gonna be trying this uh, Sanzen Omachi Tokubetsu Jumai in a minute. Omachi is the oldest rice, um, and uh, in general, Okayama had a, has a very long history going back far beyond um, when Omachi was discovered. But in the 1850s, so in particularly in 1859, there was a farmer named Kishimoto, and uh, you remember how I mentioned that volcano Mount Daisen there in Totori? So he was paying tribute uh, to that area and was just walking back from this pilgrimage to Mount Daisen. And um, he came across some gigantic plants and these rice plants were like giant. I'm talking about close to two meters, which was unheard of uh, in the rice. Um, you know, back then rice didn't, wasn't that high uh, or didn't, it wasn't that big of a plant. So he was like, these are special. He took them back to his brewery, took some cuttings back and over a few years cultivated enough of the rice to, you know, so that you could make sake with it. And, and in the late 1800s, it became a very, very popular rice for sake making. Um, some of the earliest Ginjo-like sakes uh, would have probably been using omachi, particularly around Hiroshima, where they were kind of experimenting with things like the soft brewing laws. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but in the 1920s, um, there was a variety of new rice strains that were developed or crosses of, of other rice strains, a lot of them from Omachi itself, that were just a lot easier to grow. Um, they were still tall, but maybe not as tall, etc. And so um, farmers were like, why are we growing Omachi? It's a pain in the butt to grow. Let's, let's leave it and let's start growing this and I can grow it in higher yields, etc. And so uh, what happened was in the, by the 30s, it became close to extinction. And it wasn't until the 60s that it was revived uh, by a brewer in Okoyama. And nowadays it has a cult following. There's more than 300 breweries throughout Japan that are using this rice. It's a pain in the butt to grow because it's two, it can grow to two meters, which means that it, because it's such a giant plant, you can't grow it in high yields. Um, so you gotta lower the amount of yields. It doesn't do well with chemical inputs. So um, you often have to use um, uh, crushed oyster shell and things like that as natural fertilizers in the rice fields themselves. The timing of fertilizing is really important as well um, because it can affect the shimpaku growth, et cetera. So it's a, it's a very kind of tedious rice to grow. As such, in the brewery side, it's a pain in the butt to grow with or to, to ferment. Um, it's a very soft rice, which means it leads to this beautiful, juicy, rich, earthy kind of savage backbone to it. Um, it it's a bit wild in, in general. Um, but and so I, I think a lot of the top brewers throughout Japan really love the challenge of making sake with it because it's so difficult. If you can make good sake with this, it's it's like making fantastic Pinot Noir. Um, uh, well, many in many ways, a lot of the fantastic Pinot Noir has to start in the vineyard, whereas here, a lot of it is the technique um, in the brewery. Um, but anyway, I don't want to get into that conversation right now. But let's uh, let's get into it. This is to give you an idea how important it is. I mentioned that there's about 113 sake specific rice strains. Well, Omachi um, was you know is in the ancient lineage of almost half of the sake rice strains to date and almost all of the important ones, including Yamada Nishiki and Goya Kamengoku, which is interesting. Um, everything is almost interconnected here. Uh, and so this solar system, which is meant to be on like a giant wall, of course, uh, it's not really useful for you to, you know, to, 
to eyeball all the, the names on here, but it gives you an idea that there's four generations of rice, uh, new rice strains that have been cultivated uh, from the progeny of o Omachi. Uh, that's really cool. Okay, let's get into sake, our second sake or a third sake really, the Sanzen. So Kikuchi to, uh, uh, Shuzo is, uh, is a brewery in Okayama. Uh, they're in Kurashiki, which is in the southwest, just, just kind of uh, on, the, on the west side of uh, Okayama City. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, they're using the Takahashi River uh, water um, for their brewing, which is generally soft. This is a 65% omachi rice. For those of you in Montreal, this will be really cool to try this, comparing it to the 65% polished Takani Nishiki Sotembo that you have um, for where it has that sharpness. This is going to be different. Omachi usually leads, you know how Goyaka Mengoku is a harder rice and it has like that clean, sharp, uh, light finish, light flavor profile. Well, omachi is the opposite. It has a lot of umami. You're going to get a lot more earthy attributes um, in, in the sake, savoriness. Um, it, it's just a wonderful sake that way. And generally, that Tenrei Katakuchi, that, that clean, short finish uh, of that Kide style of Echigo is pretty hard to make with Omachi. Omachi is such a soft rice that it, 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 usually you have a bit of a lingering uh, kiss of sweetness on the finish on the back end of the sake, uh, which is a, a fantastic thing. So um, the Toji for this is the president, the owner of the brewery, To Kikuchi. And, um, and basically, again, like the Sotembo, he likes to use organic rice. He does um, do, use a lot of organic omachi rice uh, in his sake making. Sanzen itself, by the way, means brilliance. So an idea that the sake is really kind of sh showing off the rice in, in, in many ways. Uh, Kikuchi-san himself uh, went to Hiroshima University uh, under in the fermentation uh, the en the fermentation engineering um, program, uh, and then came back and uh, you know kind of merged that with the Bichu uh, Toji, which is kind of we're developed we're established in that area where the brewery is, and so um, this is the perfect example of Okayama style sake in my opinion. Um, we're lucky enough to have this in the market, um, and. The other thing is as a musician, um, and I wanted to mention that um, uh, uh, Kikuchi-san uh, founded uh, a chamber orchestra in Kurashiki uh, and has been uh, awarded with a medal of, for, for his, his work in, in, in promoting culture there, but also plays Mozart when his sake is fermenting. Uh, he says that it's beneficial for the yeast uh, and whatnot. And I, I love the idea that it, that it has positive effects on the sake and, and the sake yeast being used. So on the nose, I mean, this is savory. I get banana bread. There's some sweet tones like baking spice. There's a bit of kind of bruised pear in there. It's really beautiful. Um, there's there's a, a textural, almost a uh, white peppery kind of tech, uh, a spicy component to it. And very clean, very clean. And you get that savory herbal hit at, towards the end and it keeps going. And then you finish, you get this nice sweetness. It's a really beautiful sake uh, in, in, uh, in a very typical uh, Okayama um, omachi expression. So when you're looking at omachi, you're gonna get a bit of that herbal undertone in there, which I think is coming out in this. And again, note that finish. Go back to the Kubota for a minute and compare that finish with the Sanzen. It's, it's very distinct. Here's some pictures of uh, some Omachi fields. Uh, you can see the picture of me with the tank with the Omachi uh, uh, strains hanging down. It's, it's a very tall plant, as you can see. And you can imagine how much of a pain it is when there's tropical storms and keeping it upright. Fun fact, Okayama is known for its peaches. And so, uh, I was lucky enough when I was there, it was uh, 
Uh, Nancy Matsumoto, my co-author in a book, the book that uh, Utsunomiya Sensei mentioned, and I, we were there researching our book, and we were given all these peaches. It was just amazing. They're so delicious. Um, and then uh, there's a picture of Kikuchi Shuzo there in their fermentation tank. So everything is very kind of open tank um, and very labor intensive to do what they're doing. They make it look easy, but very hard. We're going to move on just because I want to stay on time here. But uh, next up, we're going to Hyogo. Uh, Hyogo is, is very important. It's the number one uh, producer in terms of volume. A lot of big brands there, um, but a lot of high quality. Um, a lot, and these big brands make good quality sake, and it's very affordable because of it, because the, the economy is a scale. Um, and so um, I was very happy we could put the Hakutsuru on here because it, it's not only the number one selling nigori sake in Japan, but it's um, I, I really a big fan of this brewery. Um, I, as much as I love the small artisanal boutique breweries, I love the big brands for what they stand for as well. And they've been around for a long time and they they are really, uh, uh, they really uh, represent, they symbolize the history of, uh, of, of Hyogo and Nada. So these are some of the main considerations when you're thinking of uh, Hyogo. Niamizu, Niamizu is this famous water around Kobe. There's these a handful of wells that um, uh, where there's a mineral hardness that would have been important in the Edo period when you didn't have the sanitation techniques or sanitation and, uh, and uh, uh, temperature control and uh, et cetera that we have today. Um, harder water would have meant that it would have enabled a more vigorous fermentation. And at the end of the day, you did not want to stuck fermentation. Um, that was not a good thing when rice was such an important and expensive commodity back in the Edo period. So uh, Miyamizu was very important for that. Nara Gogo, the five villages in Nara. So there's five villages that encompass this historically important area of sake making. Back in the 1700s, uh, water power, um, the, the breweries in Hyogo were the first to really embrace it. So the milling wheel had been around for a while uh, before then, but uh, they realized that, hey, we could use this to polish rice. And so instead of using foot pedals or, or polishing by hand or whatnot, they were able to start using water wheels um, and it basically didn't, it wasn't a huge change. It was not like we went from like 95% polish rate to like 60%. It was like going from 95% semi buai or polish rate to like 92%. So, but that small change was a huge thing back then. And it really was um, uh, really um, uh, gave the brewers um, uh, 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 the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Basically, it just showed the quality. Uh, they were, everything that they were doing was all about quality and, and, and the, uh, the quality of the sake in markets like the Edo or uh, formerly uh, the, the former name for Tokyo um, was, was really important uh, because of things like this. Access to shipping. So uh, Kobe, you, you know, you, you're right on the water. Um, back in the Edo period, Edo became the center of power. Um, and uh, the, Kobe was very close to Kyoto, which was the capital of Japan. But everyone was, you know, the major market now was right up in Edo. So getting your sake to, to Edo was really important. And so the brewers in Edo or in Kobe were really um you know, kind of had that advent advantage and became bigger because of that. They were able to become merchants as well and, and, and ship their sake very quickly. Muramai Sado is this rice contract um, system uh, between villages uh, in Hyogo and, and some of these brewers where, you know, back in the late 1800s, rice, uh, the government really wanted, uh, encouraged uh, higher yields. Uh, and so the sake rice quality went down. And so this was a, initially a system to bring up the quality of rice um, in, in, for sake brewers. And basically by having these brewers invest uh, in, in this, in this, um, this uh, relationship with the farmer. And then of course, Yamada Nishiki, if you know two names for sake rice, I mentioned Goyaka Mangoku, Yamada Nishiki is definitely the other rice name you need to know. So as you can see, we're looking at Hyogo here we got the northern part, which is more rugged. You got the Chugoku range kind of starting. Um, it's higher altitude. It's colder. You're facing the Sea of Japan side as well, which is 
you're going to get some snow up there. Um, but in the south here, and you got Nada Gogo, the five villages right on on the right in front of the Mount Mount Roko or the Roko Mountains. Um, and then behind there, you got the northern Harima area. And just keep a note, take a mental note of this image because we're going to talk about this in a second. Uh, Miyamizu, uh, we don't have time to get into this, but in short, uh, it used to be uh, the, the aquifer that is where these wells are used to be underwater. And so with repeated flooding from the nearby rivers, uh, a lot of sea creatures just died in, in, in this area and decomposed and created all these, this calcium uh, rich area and, and, and clays and whatnot. And so what happened was uh, the water in the area happened to be low in iron, which is a really important thing for sake making. But this mineral hardness meant that they were able to make um, great sake back then. And, and the brewers in the area, the Toji guilds, the Tamba uh, in particular, um, really harnessed the power of this water in their sake making. These are the five villages. We don't have time for this, but really the, uh, the Roko Oroshi, these winds that come down from the mountains that are right, basically very steeply, uh, they, 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 they create a steep backdrop to Kobe City. Um, it's hard to not to see them because they're right, they're right there. Um, the water's coming down and also the winds in the winter that come from the Chugoku Range across the Harima area and over the Chugoku Range really have this cooling effect. And a lot of the brewers have these these back doors um, that they open in the winter to allow these cold winds into the brewery to, 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 to cool down the brewery and cool down fermentation. Again, that would have been important before you had temperature controlled tanks and things like that. Yamada Nishiki, as you can see, is not the only rice in Hyogo. Um, there's a lot of really important rice here, um, but Yamada Nishiki is the most important. Um, and it has been since the 1930s when it was, um, if, finally established and named and registered, it quickly eclipsed omachi as, um, as an important rice. And, um, and part of it has to do uh, with the fact that it has that oblong uh, shimpaku and it. it's very, very near, uh, very tightly um, um, uh, shaped. And so you can polish more of the rice without it cracking as opposed to a big round shimpaku like omachi and goyakum and goku have. Um, and also some of the amino acids in it don't, and, and, and other things that are in the rice don't compete with the, the yeast and things. So when you want to create a really pure expression of, uh, of fruit or floral, um, the rice itself doesn't get in the way like some rice strains do, um, when you're, when you're fermenting. So in terms of the word terroir, I think the only time I could comfortably say it in this session is with Yamada Nishiki and the areas behind the Roko Mountains. This area is uh, uh, kind of a textbook uh, terroir example of how, um, of, of some of the most important Yamada Nishiki field. They're so important that they show up on the label. Usually you'll, you can see Tojo, Tokue, Yamada Nishiki. It's because that's some of the most sought after Yamada Nishiki rice in Japan. It's more expensive as well. It's really hard to get. Um, you've got to be very lucky and have a special relationship with some of those villages to be able to obtain it. Uh, and so, um, and, and really what is unique to the area is diurnal temperatures. So by late August, the temperature difference from day and night is quite wide as much as nine, 19 degrees is what I've heard. Um, and so that, and kind of like grapevines, that diurnal temperature, the fluctuation between day and nighttime temperatures is really important for rice in parts of the season, particularly when the rice is starting to ripen. Another thing is the soils. The soils in the area are deep clay soils um, with a lot of um, smack tight soils. I'm not going to get into that right now. We just don't have the time, but it has all the right nutrients for the rice. And also these glutinous soils allow the, the, the roots to delve deep down into the soils, as much as a meter down. Okay, and these are the Tokue fields. So these are the villages in uh, behind the Roko Mountains that uh, produce so-called Tokue, the special A uh, fields. Um, and so you'll often see them, if you see them on a bottle of particularly a Junmai Daiginjo, <clears throat> you know that they're from this area and they're, it, you know, it's special, right? There's even a brewery in the area uh, called Honda Shoten that's actually exploring 
uh, this whole idea with terroir is taking it up a step and they've got, they're using rice from different rice fields that the, the soil is slightly different and they're trying to explore why, like what um, the differences in the soil uh, might contribute to the sake making. So again, keep in mind, a lot of this is new. There's not a full picture yet of what exactly is going on, but it's, it's really interesting. Some of the 35 million year old petrified wood that was in the area that really has been part in contributing to those mineral, the mineral uh, richness of the soils. Um, let's get into our video here with Sachiko Miyagi from Tipsy Sake. She's a portfolio manager there. She's also a JSA uh, Sake Diploma um, um, holder, also the Sake Scholar. So a lot of things on her, uh, on her resume. And she's here to talk us through the Sayuri. So taste along if you can, please. Hi, Michael. Hi, everyone. My name is Sachiko. I work for Tipsy Sake based in, in Los Angeles. We sell sake online. And the Hapitsuru Sayuri Nigori is one of our best sellers. You can see the sediments there. I haven't agitated it uh, on purpose, and I'll tell you why in a second. Um, Hapitsuru was founded in 1743 in the Nada Gobo region within Kobe City in Hyogo Prefecture. And Nada Gobo area really is a sake mecca. There's tons of, um, there's a lot of really big companies. Uh, sake makers there, and Hakutsuru is one of them. They are one of the largest sake making companies, and it's a port city. So they used to ship a bunch of sake, a really good quality sake, to the present day Tokyo, which is Edo. I'll tell you why I haven't uh, mixed this up. It's because I'm a sake geek, and I like to investigate sake by not mixing it and having just the top. Um, so this is the top portion of the sake. I haven't accidentally uh, walking around with a bottle mixed, um, slightly agitated version of it. And I have the mixed version with all the sake leaves and the sediments, um, which is how it's meant to be consumed. So very opaque, surprisingly opaque, can't see anything through it. Um, this one, if you put it over your book, you can see that there's letters, but um, it's distorted. You can't read it. So oh, uh, not as clear as white wine for sure. And aromatic wise, really expressive. First one is really, really expressive. Um, a lot of honeysuckle, lilikoi, um, and uh, the intensity is pretty amazing. Um, not as aromatic, pretty much the same uh, aroma notes. And then the last one is where you get way more of the lactic notes, but it's a lot more muted, um, some brightness to it and kind of, you know, like the yogurt kind of uh, brightness to it. And taste-wise, very sweet uh, with the sediments. Way drier than I ever expected. But it made sense once I had it. This is a Nada sake. This is true to Nada style. So um, this is when they say it's a masculine sake style sake. It has a kire that's really solid. It's different from like a Niigata style kire that clean finish. Um, Niigata style is a lot more silkier to me. And then the Nada style is a lot more like bold, um, dry finish. So it has a, a dryness to it but uh, revealed to me this the underlying structure and it also has a shibumi which is um, a bitterness and I'm always delighted when I can find a shibumi in uh, premium sake because to me that's like tannins it's um, providing that structure and if you had just the sweetness the converted sugar from the starch um, with the koji process uh, just that your your tongue might get your palate might be a, a little tired, but because it's balanced with actually a dryness in the liquid and that shibumi, um, it, I think it really balances it out. So before I had the uwazumi, this this investigation, I was thinking, oh, it probably goes well with 
something like teriyaki sauce, like a sweet, um, thick sauce. And now I want to have it with some charred meat, like a, a yakitori, which is a chicken on skewers with some char on it. Um, so this investigation was really fun for me. I did warm it up. Um, I've had some beautiful nigori that has been warmed up for a pairing for me. And so I wanted to try it. Don't warm it up too much would be my recommendation, um, but maybe gently warmed up to like 40 degrees Celsius, um, about person temperature, about 100 degrees Fahrenheit um, might be kind of nice. And some different vessels. Um, I just hope you get really intimate with it and and try it with different spices. And it is a very versatile um, style. And even if it's, even though it's a sweet sake, it has that, that dryness um, underlying that was my investigation. Um, I'm really looking forward to the rest of the program. Um, I hope uh, you enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you, Sachiko san. Yeah, this is, this is <clears throat> I'll admit, Nigori, and I usually gravitate to filtered sakes, but um, uh, instead of the cloudy sakes, but this is my kind of Nigori. I like the sharpness. I like the sh shibumi that uh, Sachiko san mentioned. Shibumi is this pleasant, pleasing astringency that you can find in sake sometimes. Um, and that does help kind of keep it kind of give it a bit of a sharpness uh, that balances, I think, that sweetness that you might find. Surprisingly, this is 12.5% alcohol. Um, it's lower than I, I thought, but I, I think it's made for a drinker um, that necessarily doesn't want a higher alcohol uh, sake, you know, that's in that 15 to 17% range. So it's, it's kind of friendly that way. And that minus 11 sake meter value, you know, again, it, this isn't that sweet. Um, and some of the sweetness is coming for, from the, the, the dissolved rice, um, but I think it's very balanced um, uh, uh, and, and a great example of what nigori can be. Um, and I love that uh, you don't mix it up fully at the beginning. I mean, in a restaurant, you'd probably want to, so that way everyone's getting the same amount and not all the rice, but it's a really interesting experiment to do when you're trying this is to, to try it at different levels of, uh, of sediment. Um, uh, yeah, just to see what the different characters are. It's, it's a bit like trying different glasswares and things like that with the same sake to see what comes out of it. Anyway, uh, let's move on to Hiroshima. So Hiroshima, we're going south now. This is our most Southern of the sakes that we're gonna be trying or sake, uh, sake regions we're gonna be exploring. And um, it's home to the National Research Institute of Brewing. Um, so a lot of uh, scientific studies are done here to understand fermentation um, and uh, the role of yeast, the role of water, the role of other things in, in sake. Um, there's also um, an assessment set up there so brewers can come and develop um, uh, their tasting skills. I, I've, I've been privy to a part of it and not the whole thing um but uh you know like where you have to blind taste through acidity and things like that it's really interesting um they also run something called the zenkoku shinshu kampyokai which is uh the national yu sake competition uh and so every year uh for 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 each brewing license a brewery has, and most breweries just have one, you can submit one sake to the brewing comp uh, this brewing competition. Um, and so it's it's a way of uh, being able to uh, have the sakes assessed by those members of NRIB uh, and, uh, and get some feedback for your sakes. And so this is a really important educational thing for them. It's also home to Senza Bureau Miura, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, he's uh, in many ways the the uh, the grandfather of ginjo early ginjo making techniques. Um, so as you can see, this is Hiroshima. It's um, it, you know in terms of the Chugoku area, it's central. It, it, it touches on all the other prefectures in the area, um, and uh, it historically played it was an important crossroads between uh, the, the west of Japan and south or in the east. Sorry, um, and also a lot of industry here. Um, 
yeah, it, it's it, it's it, it has a lot of history which we can't get into in, in great detail. I, what I want to do is really dive into uh, Saijo um, and and explore that Kamo Izumi. So Senzabura Mura uh, is um, in the late 1800s. Uh, Senzabura Mura basically went to Hyogo, so Nada. We just finished talking about Nada. Water there is harder, right? They got that Miyamizu water. So the way they made sake with that, um, you know, he learned these techniques and then came back. Um, but the problem was that in Akitsu, where he's from in, in uh, Hiroshima, the water is, is softer. Uh, it still has a hardness. Um, it's not as soft as Niigata, but it was softer than the water you would find in, in the Miyamizu wells in Nara. And so he was like, well, this, this stinks. I can't make good sake with these techniques I just learned uh, the way that they are. Something's got to give. And so he uh, started, you know, doing a lot of experiments to figure this out and came up with his soft water brewing techniques. And part of it was that brewers in Nada, because they had a lot of minerals in the water, the minerals basically were food for the yeast, which meant the fermentation occurred very quickly, which meant that in order to keep up with that, you needed a high, a good sugar production going on with that. So the koji that they made there uh, had a lot of enzymes. Uh, you really had a, a thick growth of koji on the rice. And so that it would produce a lot of sugars that could be, can be fermented into alcohol quickly uh, in that balancing act between the koji and the yeast. Well, it, because you have softer water in uh, Hiroshima, you couldn't do the same thing. It created off flavors and things didn't occur perfectly. And so uh, he was he was at the, uh, the, the cusp of um, developing that Tsuki has a koji. So basically shaping the way the koji grow, uh, grew on the rice and, and whatnot. So that's one thing. The other is uh, there's a gentleman named Ryuchi Satake who developed the vertical rice polishing machine uh, about uh, maybe 30 or 40 years after that. So in, I think 1933 is officially when it came out. So just right about then. And that was invented in Hiroshima as well. And brewers in Saijo uh, were some of the first to embrace these polishing machines. And Senzabura Mura's uh, findings with soft water brewing laws, he published um, to brewers in Hiroshima. He wanted the Hiroshima sake to become better. And so in many ways, the two of these things are, gave birth to early Ginjo sake making. You had the rice polishing machine, which could polish down the rice to uh, higher percentages. And you had, and, and, and that meant that had repercussions in what, how you treated koji and things like that. So these two things were, were very important. And the brewers in Saijo were some of the first brewers to really embrace all this. Um, the other factor is Hatan Nishiki, which is, um, I'd say there's a number of Hatan uh, rices uh, in Japan. Hatan Nishiki is, is one of the top five rice grains in Japan uh, in terms of cultivation and a very popular rice in southwest Japan um, and very important. Hatan So is an heirloom rice. It's one of the grandparents it, uh, of, of Hatan Nishiki. And, um, and so uh, unfortunately, we're not trying Hatan Nishiki on this, but we're still going to get a really good example of what uh, the Hiroshima sake style is all about. So we're going to Saijo here. And as you can see, Saijo is a basin kind of to the east of Hiroshima City. It's in an area called Higashi Hiroshima. And it's in this basin. They enjoy diurnal temperatures. Some of the rice that they use is grown kind of no a bit north of there. Uh, where you get a bit of that diurnal temperature from the Chugoku Mountains coming down. And, um, and so you've got a handful of breweries here in this area called Sakadora, uh, Sakagura Dori, which is Sakag uh, Sake Road, basically, or Sake Street. Uh, and so all these breweries are in like a two block radius of each other. It's a really cool area to go and do flights. There's, there's a, a sake festival that occurs there every year that I can imagine must be a lot of fun. Um, and so um, the, the brewers in the area are using pretty much the same water, but I've read from a number of breweries that that water has a, it has a different taste at each brewery, even though the, the breweries are within a block uh, of each other. So this is really interesting. 
also not fully understood. Uh, and so my hope is in the future, we'll, we'll understand this more. Um, but generally the water, even though it's softer than nada, it still has a hardness to it. So I find that you still do get a bit of a sharpness and a really beautiful umami flavor in sake of Hiroshima. So let's try the Honjikomi. So this is from a fantastic brewery called Kamo Izumi. Um, uh, Izumi is spring water. So it's um, talking about the water in the area and Kamo is referring to Kyoto. So the water is similar to the water you'd, you'd find in Kyoto in many ways. And so, um, in many ways, some of the things that they did at the brewery, uh, they produced some of the earliest Junmai sake. Um, so no added brewer's alcohol, uh, particularly after the war when um, the common practice was adding brewer's alcohol. And uh, this is a fantastic Hiroshima style Junmai Daiginjo. You often think of Junmai Daiginjo as being fruity and floral and you know bursting out of the glass. This is a very elegant Jumai, and there's nothing wrong with fruity floral, by the way, but this is a foods Jumai Daiginjo. It is um, understated, it's elegant, it's, you get, you get the flavors of the rice and you get some fresh cut grass, you get a bit of spice, and then there's some apple, but not just fresh apple, like more like a, well, a fresh gala apple, more of a pear-like apple than a, you know, a crisp, um, you know, green apple, for instance, and hint of mushroom. Um, so it, it, there's a, it, it skirts the line between savory and fruity, and it does such a beautiful job. The yeast, by the way, KA1 is, uh, refers to the, the one of the, um, the Kumamoto, Kumamoto uh, uh, yeast. It's one of the most important uh, ginjo yeasts, or one of the first ginjo yeasts to be developed also known as Kyokai number nine on my fancy little galaxy of rice, uh, sake yeast, I'm sorry. Um, so let's try this. Um, so um, I should mention Maegaki-san um, is, uh, Kazuhiro Maegaki is the current president. He's also the president of Sake Samurai Association. He actually indu inducted myself and Alex, uh, a sake samurai in 2018. Um, and he wasn't president of the brewery then. Um, so it was really cool. Um, I, I was lucky enough to meet him last, I guess in 2020, right before the pandemic uh, started. And um, he had, I think he was a month into being awarded or not awarded, but uh, you know, being becoming president of the brewery, um, which is really cool. Uh, Juichi Maigaki uh, is the, um, ancestor that started the brewery uh, in 1912 and the family were rice wholesalers before so they were already connected to to rice and uh, and sake making albeit a little bit indirectly this is delicious slightly chilled um and there's a sharpness on the finish. There's umami. It's beautiful. It's a really beautiful mouthfeel to the sake. I would encourage you, you know, you often hear, don't heat up Jumai Daiginjos. I think this one, you could actually warm up gently, maybe to like 40 degrees Celsius and see what happens. I think it's, it's because it's not overly aromatic and floral. Um, I think you'd be able to coax out some new flavors uh, in the, in the rice and in the sake uh, by doing that. Um, and you can see the acidity on this is 1.7. That that would be kind of around a medium plus on the on the on a tasting scale. So there's some a bright acidity. To me, this is a food sake. Um, in Japan, uh, particularly in Hiroshima, oysters are very prevalent. Uh, oyster cuisine, and uh, uh, this is uh, pic the picture of the oysters is at Kamo Izumi. Um, uh, my guck son's mom is one of the best chefs you'll ever come across and she made this phenomenal meal she's i know they entertained the united nations uh you know a few years before then and they they're not they're used to entertaining um you know uh, uh you know people with these extravagant dinners the, you can see their tea house there overlooking this beautiful rock garden that's that's just famous in hiroshima here's my gut my guck son right there in the top left and then Sakadura, Sakagura Dori on the right there. And so these chimneys um, are very well preserved and every brewery has one. This is how they used to, you know, their, their rice steamer 
would have been right around that chimney and and basically all that's the 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 steam would have been going up through these chimneys back in the day a lot of these chimneys aren't used anymore but um uh these are some of the best preserved examples of the of them that you'll see in japan uh from a sake brewer while you savor this let's move on to shizuoka um this is i'm, I'm loving this right now i'm just going to keep um i might indulge a little and try a little bit more in a minute. Um, but let's get into Shizuoka. So Shizuoka, we're, we're now going to Mount Fuji. We're going back uh, just kind of north and east uh, towards Tokyo. We're going to be about roughly about a 15 minute train ride outside of Tokyo to get to Doi Shuzo, where we're heading to uh, in, um, in Shizuoka. And so it's home to Mount Fuji. It's home to a lot of great sencha tea and wasabi root uh, cultivation. The area is very pure. If you're growing high quality green tea, if you're cultivating wasabi, you need the purest of pure waters. And the region has it. It has a lot of the mountains that taper. You've got the Southern Alps that kind of come down on the Western flanks of Shizuoka or in the Northern side of it, so Northwestern side. And then you got Mount Fuji in the Northeastern side. There you go, it was a good picture of it. So um, there's a number of rivers coming down. These water systems, uh, you know, help to feed the breweries uh, throughout the prefecture. Uh, and, um, and you also have a very mild climate um, that meets the cooler mountain alpine climate of, of the mountains. So on, along the coast there, it's quite mild. You get this warm, uh, it's called the Kuroshio. It's the uh, uh, black current. And it basically it's these warm waters that come down from Southeast Asia. Um, and basically um, bring up all kinds of foodstuffs with it. Um, and so parts of the area, great for tuna, in particular in Shizuoka, um, uh, Sakura Ebi. So cherry shrimp uh, is very, very popular. Also eel, if you're going there, you got to try their eel, it's fantastic. Um, so again, no shortage of pure water. Generally it's on the softer side and these are some of the river systems that you would you would uh, be using for their, their water. Um, generally in the area, kind of like how the Hiroshima style has some kind of level of umami in it. Um, what I would say, uh, and, and you got the Tenrei Katakuchi style and you got the, the style I would, I, I would classify in Shizuoka is this very easy drinking fruity style. But fruity, not in this overly explosive fruity floral aromas. The sakes generally have some fruity element, but more on the banana side. So there's there's two camps on the on the sake side. There's those that create isoamyl acetate, which is more the banana side. And then there's the ethyl caproate side of apple and trop some tropical fruit. Um, the the godfather of uh, sake yeast in Shizuoka really didn't like the ethyl caproate side and really stuck to developing yeasts that are more on that banana side. So generally you get this really soft, fruity banana um, and maybe melon uh, in the profile. And it's usually moderate. It's it's elegant. It's not, they don't want it to be over the top. They want their sakes to, be, to, to go well with food. Again, um, it's this is food sake in a very different way than the the food sake of Kamo Izumi. It's it's fruity, it's approachable style, and generally lower in acidity. So these are the suite of yeast that you use in Shizuoka. Um, so they can use some of the pre the uh, the uh, Kyokai uh, yeast as well, but HD one is a very important one, and that's the one we're going to be trying with the Kayun shortly. Homari Fuji is their local rice. Um, it's a um, it's a mutated version uh, or a mutant of Yamada Nishiki. It basically was uh, exposed to gamma ray radiation and and basically mutated into Homari Fuji. And if brewers use it, they can use the logo that you see in the bottom right there. Uh, this example of Yamada Nishiki we're going to be trying, the Kayun, is with Yamada Nishiki. Um, and without further ado, I'm bringing Bo Timken, Sake Samurai, and the owner of Chu Sake to, uh, to, to guide you through the sake. Greetings from San Francisco. I'm Bo Timken, and I've been charged with speaking about Kayun Sake for the next five to seven minutes. I'll try to keep it short. I just did one take, and it was a little bit long because I'm verbose. Um, I opened the first sake store outside of Japan 20 years ago, and I've been selling Kayun sake for 20 years. I'm friends of the brewers, I'm friends of the family, I've been to the brewery, and I've 
I know this sake intimately. I also know your sake intimately. I found out that you probably are drinking um, September 2021 released. Mine is a little bit older, um, but I have been doing notes every year for 20 years on Cayune, and I know what you're gonna drink. I know it's a wonderfully impactful sake, and I know it's a like a gateway sake. This is one of those beautiful rice and water brews that teaches people like, wow, how can rice and water taste like this? And if they're used to old uh, jet fuel hot socket and they taste this, it just woos them and wows them and brings them over. Um, Better Fortune, as the sake is known, is a Jumai Ginjo, but it could actually be called a Jumai Dai Ginjo because it's milled Semai Buai to 50%. The, the, from Yamada Nishiki Brewing Rice, which is the best, from Hyogo Prefecture, which is the rice, the best Yamada Nishiki rice is grown in, in Hyogo. Um, the acidity on the sake is 1.4, and the SMV or the Nihonshu Do is plus five. It's relatively a dry sake. And that is sort of the trick of Shizuoka style sakes. They are fruity and dry. So they have body, but they have drying. And to add to the fact that this guy is 16, 17% alcohol, um, it also adds a sort of a drying mechanism. And on a second sort of more super note, it helps preserve the sake in the bottle a little bit longer. Mine is actually sort of long in the tooth, but it drinks still great. Um, the kobo that these guys use, there's the Shizoko kobo, but uh, this brewery has, you know, defined their own HD1 that they call it. They isolated the HD1, and that's what's driving sort of this brew. It's a fantastic sake, and I'm sure you guys, as you're tasting it, to get a ton of fruit tones. The aroma is very fruity, very floral. The flavor has a ton of impact, great body, and a very drying finish. And I use three glasses when I do my tastings because I feel like people will go and drink at home out of something that I don't usually write a review about. And I've written over 2,000 reviews, so I find that if I blend the reviews, um, this sake in particular, Better Fortune as it's known, um, uses a water source that's kind of unique in the sake world. They are in an area known for pristine and beautiful water because there's a ton of wasabi farms near them. There's a ton of ocha or tea production areas, and both those require very clean, beautiful water sources. Um, but Cayune, Doi Shuzo, I love saying it. I think of Homer Simpson every time I say that. Doi Shuzo. Um, they truck their water in. So when I go to the brewery, you see these trucks and it's just like, that, that's their water source. And I always find that fascinating. They're also very green, they use solar, and then they um, clean their water when they're done with it. They do a filtration system so they could have put it back into the city water. They're sort of emphatic in that way. Very small brewery, there's only eight people, eight, eight, eight employees. Um, their toji, I've known two tojis in my lifetime being there, and the toji before that was one of the four great tojis of no tojis of all time. So they have a great name in the industry. They're, you know, along with the lines of a wakatake, isojiman, but Doishuzo has this certain je ne sais quoi. Very uh, fascinating brewery. Um, small, they use 700 kilogram, kilogram tanks, which are relatively small batch tanks. And they also only do about 90 shikomi each brewing season. So that's not a lot. In 2019, um, when I went there, I was reminded that they had won the IWC trophy for their Ginjo, um, which is impressive. I'm co-chairman of the International Wine Challenge out of London, the largest sort of commercial uh, tasting in the world for sake and wine. And they just make killer sake. And I hope you're enjoying this. I just know that in the sake world, um, what keeps me coming back are amazing sakes that are just, they tell a story, they have positivity to them. They're, people ask, well, why do I keep doing this after 20 years and why do I love selling sake so much? I'm reminded of the old Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers debate where Fred Astaire, who I think represents wine, would say like, I'm a great dancer. And Ginger Rogers would say, look, I did everything that Fred Astaire did, but I just did it backwards and in heels. And uh, I think that's awesome. I think that's sake. So that's about my five and a half minutes. Um, I hope you enjoyed this brew. If you ever have a chance, they do like having visitors come and visit them. Um, I just wanted to say really quickly that since this is better fortune, let's hope our friends in Ukraine, let's shoot a little better fortune their way, hopefully. And uh, I just want to remind you that sake is awesome. And so are you. Have a great day.
Thank you very much, Bo. That was fantastic. Um, and uh, good for a few smiles with the doi uh, shuzo. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, Bo covered everything there. I can't really, um, I don't want to really add anything else, but you know, to mention the better fortune, um, often at New Year's and any auspicious occasions, this is, make, this is a very popular gift in Japan um, because it, it's like a good luck sake um, to, to give someone. Uh, and so, yeah, it's a phenomenal brew. Um, and what I love is it's fruity, but as Bo mentioned, it's very clean on the finish. Um, the, there's a, there's a dryness that comes in hint of shibumi. So a bit of hint of astringency that really kind of, kind of makes it this very interesting on the palate for me. Um, here's a few pictures of Shuzo, Doi Shuzo, um, some of the barrels. Um, and uh, anyway, let's get into our last sake here. So we got Miyagi coming up. So Miyagi, we're going to the northeastern uh, side of uh, Japan here. Um, and uh, it is, has no shortage of high caliber sake breweries there. Um, it's also influenced, it has been influenced by a lot of the brewer, the, the, the Nambu Toji, arguably the most important or most prolific of the Toji guilds. So there we've talked, we've alluded to Tanba from Nara, and we've alluded to Echigo Toji from Igata. And Nambu is the, the third of the, the, the big three um, Toji guilds. Uh, and again, Nambu is historically the old name for that area of the Northeastern um, uh, Japan. So uh, Sendai uh, was founded by Date Masamune, a daimyo in the area and really encouraged sake brewing. And a fun fact, if those of you who like Star Wars out there, Darth Vader's helmet um, was modeled on Date Masamune's helmet. I'm not kidding. Look it up. I, in my Saki Scholar textbook, I actually have a picture, a comparison of the two. because I, I, I do find it kind of fascinating. I love when there's pop culture uh, references that are connected to, you know, historical Japan. Um, so let's uh, let's look at it here. So you can see where ha ha Hagino Shuzo is. It's located up in the uh, the north part of, of Japan, and that's a uh, uh, Miyagi, and that's a, an important area. So you see Osaki there. Osaki there is in the foothills of the O Mountains, and that area historically is very important in Miyagi for sake uh, rice cultivation. Um, also, Miyagi is is one of these area is known for making high caliber sake with table rice. Um, they, uh, they're, they're, they're the so-called land of Junmai sake. Um, they, you can make, you can get some fantastic sakes here made with uh, table rice strains like Sasa Nishiki um, and Hitome Bore and they're just as good as sakes made with the sake specific rice strains like Yamada Nishiki or whatever. Um, and so Hagino Shuzo is up there. It's, they're in a great area. They're kind of in the foothills of the mountains on the border with Iwate. Um, and, and again, where the word Iwate is, is roughly around where you would have found the Nambu Toji uh, Guild formation. Um, so very close to there. Um, and so before we go into the, the sake, I wanted to talk about uh, the differences in, between Yamaha and, and the other sakes you had, because that's one of the things that make this special. This is a Yamaha Junmai. So historically, uh, if you went back 400, 450 years ago, sake was made in the method called Kimoto. They would use a hangiri. So you see a small, short, flat barrel. Uh, you put your rice in and you'd have many, many of these all over the place. And brewers would, would basically take these wooden oars and do something called Yama Oroshi. And basically, they pulverize the rice. And when they're doing that, they're basically trying to mix the enzymes that the koji is producing throughout uh, with all the rice. But at the same time, um, particularly in the first two weeks of this process, which takes about four weeks to do, um, you're waiting for these two little dancing uh, creatures you see on here, the lactic acid bacteria, to basically kind of propagate in on the rice. It's attracted to steamed rice. And so lactic acid bacteria grows, creates lactic acid. Lactic acid basically sterilizes the batch so that yeast can actually thrive in this environment. Um, and then it eventually kills itself off as well in there. Uh, and so after about a four week period, fermentation can start. You've got to, I, you, at about the, 
after the second week, yeast starts to be to propagate in there because of what the lactic acid's done. And so after four weeks, you've got a yeast population and now we can start fermentation. Yamahai, or sorry, we'll talk about Yamahai in a second. Now we go to the right tank, you got Sokujo. So everything that we have here, except for the Miyagi Sake, um, the Hiwata, is a, in the Sokujo method. Sokujo is the modern way, the fast moto, basically. Um, and uh, basically in the early 1900s, he realized, hey guys, what if we just add lactic acid instead of waiting for lactic acid bacteria to propagate in the tank? Um, we can speed up the whole process by two, two weeks. Lactic acid's in there. We can add our yeast right away and it'll thrive in this environment and propagate. And then we can get, our, get on with fermentation. So it, clean, it, you, it creates cleaner flavors. So generally that four week process, you've got a bit more um, umami, um, lactic acid, uh, or like this creamy kind of textured layered component that comes through in Kimoto versus Sokujo, which is going to be cleaner on the, on the palate. Yamaha is basically an offshoot of Kimoto. So it's, they realized right around the time they, 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 there's Sokujo was starting to become popular that, Hey guys, if we just kind of adjust our water content in the, in the, in the moto and whatever, and we get rid of the poles, which would be fun because these are really labor intensive and we, we can get on with um, it, the whole process, but we're not going to add lactic acid. We're going to use lactic acid bacteria to, to create lactic acid in the tank. So it's still a, a long process like Kimoto. It takes four weeks, but without the labor, of the Yama Oroshi. And that's what Yama Hai stands for. It stands for Yama Oroshi Haishi. So basically Haishi is to seize the poles, seize the Yama Oroshi basically. And, and that's where you get Yama Hai. And so when you get Yama Hai's, generally you're going to have these, this, this um, complexity on the palate. You can have higher levels of umami. You can have higher levels of acidity in the sake. Um, and this is a really a cool example, because this is what I would call a, a very elegant Yamaha Junmai. Um, it's from uh, Hagino Shuzo. Um, the Hiwata, so they make two lines. They make the Hagino Tsuru uh, line, uh, and, which is their flagship line. And then there's this Hiwata line, which is a newer brand um, that, that started in 2002. Um, it was launched by Yohei Sato. Um, uh, who's the eldest son of the Sato family who owns the brewery. Um, he went to Tokyo Nodai, which is um, the uh, Tokyo Nodai is this uh, university of, uh, school of agriculture in Tokyo. It's the equivalent of the UC Davis of the sake making um, uh, side, uh, sake making world. Um, most brewers now are coming through the Tokyo Nodai school um, doing a, you know, a, a master's in microbiology or whatnot, uh, because again, you're, you are, um, in sake making, you, you really need to be experts in, in working with two microbes, uh, in the same tank. And it's really important that you understand what they're all about. Um, so Hiwata was formed. Um, and so Hiwata itself means circular field, um, uh, where a grain could be dedicated to the ancient gods, um, where, where, where the rice was grown. So it's, there's, I, I love that idea. And, and it's also bringing people together in a circle. So it's, it, it's, it, it, I don't know. It, there's, there's something kind of uh, romantic about that idea for me. Um, so this is uh, a sake made with Goya, Kamengoku and Miyama Nishiki. Again, look at where we are. If you look at the map of Japan, Miyagi is just basically on the other side of the O range. And just a little Southwest of there is um, you're, you're basically right in Niigata, home of Goyaka Mangoku. And then just a little bit southwest of there as well, you're in Nagano, home to Miyama Nishiki. So the influences of those rice strains uh, have been prevalent in, in the Tohoku area. The, the prefecture is in the northern part of, of, of the main island uh, for a long time. So again, both of these are harder rice strains. Um, Miyama Nishiki does lead to a little bit more of a rich uh, profile on the palate, but finishes with a sharp finish. And then Goyakum, Goyakum and Goku, we've already talked about, leads to a lighter flavor profile, um, that Tanrei Katakuchi style. So when you bring that into effect with the Yamaha um, method, which, you know, it's a longer uh, process to get the fermentation off the ground. Uh, the moto takes four weeks. You've got some complexity. You've got some depth to the sake. It's, it's, um, it, when it, this is my, was my first time trying the sake. 
Um, and I was very impressed with it. It's quite elegant. It would be great with food. It would be great at a variety of different service temperatures. If you wanted to bring out more of that umami, gently warm this one up and I think it'll be magic. Um, if, you, if you're having some rich dish tonight um, or some, some meat or game uh, in the next few days, um, I would save some of this hiwata warm it up and try it with that. I think you, you'd be very pleasantly surprised at how well it'll match uh, some, some of those richer flavors. But again, 65%, um, yeah, this is savory. There's, there's some fruit, um, soft, soft fruit, soft banana uh, textures to this, a bit of spice to it, a bit of white pepper. They're using Miyagi Kobo, and, and Bo mentioned this in his video, Kobo. Kobo is yeast in Japanese, if you didn't pick up on that. Um, alcohol is 16%. I think it's right in the middle of the typical range of, uh, of what sake can be. Um, and it's at a plus four. So it's on the drier side. So it's going to be dry with this nice umami uh, backbone to it. A little white mushroom as well. And you probably get more of those savory mushroom maybe a little bit of soy sauce coming out if you if you warmed it up. There's even a kiss of soy sauce in, the, in that finish. Some herbal uh, notes as well. Uh, so the, again, a lot of cereal, some honey. It's, this is delicious. Um, I mean, all the sakes are fantastic. I hate to call one out as being more delicious than the other. They're all such different examples of, of, uh, of what sake could be. Um, one thing I wanted to mention, um, so hagi no tsuru, hagi. Um, I didn't know what a hagi is, but um, on the brewery, brewery website, they had noted uh, the hagi flowers. So hagi no tsuru is uh, cranes of the hagi flowers or something in, 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 um, in uh, like as a direct translation. But these are hagi flowers here. These are these bright flowers. They grow in the countryside in the fall. Um, and so uh, they adorn the, the countryside near this brewery. Uh, in northern Miyagi and uh, really beautiful. Last thing I wanted to say is if you like oysters, I know the Kamo Izumi we talked about Hiroshima and it's oysters. Miyagi is no stranger to oysters as well. They have their own uh, kinds as well in the area that, that they're famous for that they come in the season usually I think in a late part of the year into I think into March. It's like a two or three month window. Um, and I think there's a bit of salinity on this sake that I think would go really well with the oyster, uh, would match really well with oysters. Um, so we're definitely worth uh, looking up. This is a little shameless promotion for uh, Nancy Matsumoto and I's book coming out. Uh, it was delayed. It was supposed to be out on March, uh, March 8th, but now it's, it's due out on May 10th. Uh, it's available for pre-order. We are trying to get it into some of the local Toronto bookstores as well. If you want to support some of your local bookstores, just let us know. We'd love to send our, um, our salespeople um, some of the bookstores the books should be going into if you want to help promote it that way. Um, and uh, yeah, a big, very, a very big thank you for sticking with it. I'm sorry we went a bit long. Um, but uh, I do hope you, you know, we really scratched to the surface on a lot of different aspects of sake making. Um, and I, I do hope you found it enjoyable. I hope you found the sake is enjoyable. Um, and if you want to connect with any of the people that we're talking today, um, um, like Sachiko or Alex or, or Bo or even uh, Utsunomiya Sensei, um, you have their uh, Instagram handles there. Feel free to direct message them if you have any questions or if you're reading you're visiting any of those areas of the world. Um, and at this point, we'll just uh, see if there's any questions. Um, I know my colleague, Yuri Yesan, was, uh, was answering some things. See a couple of questions here. Um, so Andrew is asking about the charts. Uh, unfortunately, these charts are created. Um, I, I created all these charts uh, for my, my, my course. I, I do a regional course on sake regionality uh, called sake scholar course uh, and that's where those are from maybe at some point they'll be available uh, for download or, or for purchase or something but I haven't really thought that far in advance um, and I'm sorry Renee you wanted to go back to the Ontario slide and um, not sure which slide that is but just reach out to me um, uh, specifically and I'm happy to to, uh, to 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 talk to you through that um, 
Yeah, and Roger, the Kiseki no Osake, yeah, I the uh, the brewery. I would love to bring this in the market at some point. I've never seen it here, but I've, I've read about this. It's a great story. Any other questions? Let's see. There's some open questions. Yeah. So, John, um, your question about um, su subsequent bottles um, include the GI on the label. To give you an idea, two years ago, I had a sake from Mie that didn't have uh, the Mie sticker. And over the pandemic, Mie was awarded a GI. Um, and all of a sudden, the logo popped up. So Niigata Sake is so new that what you're probably going to have to wait is for the next brewing uh, cycle. Uh, so probably, um, I would say probably in in the spring of 2023, or maybe the fall of this year, we may see the labels starting to come up on the label or on the logos, because I know the brewers will be anxious to really promote their GI. Um, and so right now, you can look out uh, that, that original Niigata OC sticker. Um, there's also another Niigata stick, uh, logo that sometimes is on labels. You can look out for those. And I would actually pay attention to any of these logos and moving forward. Um, like some of the kanji on there, yeah, it's hard to, to, to pick off uh, right away. But like I mentioned with Omachi, knowing, I mean, I think it says Omachi in the back of this anyway uh, with the English label. But, um, you know, paying attention to some of those little details in the bottle does tell a, a, a bit of its story, which is definitely worth it. Um, Pablo had a question about Toshimori Shuzo. You are bang on. Um, if I could award sake uh, to you, I would. Uh, that's right. Uh, Toshimori Shuzo was the brewery that uh, revived Omachi um, and brought it back uh, to its, its former glory um, in Okayama. Um, and then there was one question here. Are some sakes brewed with natural indigenous yeast without any added? And if so, how do we achieve that brew? There are some. Uh, it's quite rare to do that. A lot of breweries are uh, propagating their own yeast. Uh, and they call it Kuratsuki Kobo. Um, but uh, for the most part, um, there's not a lot of indigenous yeast, as in just kind of naturally occurring yeast in the tank. It's fairly hard when you're dealing with other microbes as well in the tank, um, but some breweries are doing it. Um, just, just, it's quite a rare occurrence to see. And I, I don't know of any of it being available in Ontario or Quebec at the mo moment. Um, with that said, I know we went a bit over, so I'm gonna, I, we'll stop it here. And I, I, I just wanna say thank you very much to everyone uh, for, for tuning in. Hopefully we'll be able to do this again in the very near future. Um, and uh, stay tuned uh, on Instagram, on any of the channels, uh, particularly mine for Ontario. I like to trumpet when you sake is coming into the market uh, and let you know uh, what's available. And uh, if you're in Quebec, uh, I, I'm not as in tune with the market, but do reach out if you're an importer and you're bringing in some sake and it's just released. I'm happy to help um, get the word out there so people can, can enjoy it while it's, it's fresh. Thank you very much, everyone. Come by and uh, enjoy the rest of your sake. Bye-bye.